A storm rages outside of the little old house, as inside, a little old woman bounces a little baby on her little old knee. The baby coos and laughs as the old woman makes funny faces and noises for the child, trying to keep it entertained as they wait for his parents to return from their much-needed night out by themselves. The old woman herself needs a rest now, though. He's forgotten how exhausting it can be to watch a child. Okay, that's enough. It's time for both of us to take a little nap before your parents get back. She gets up and takes the baby into a nearby room that looks as though it was a nursery at one time, but it hasn't been used for many years. As she goes to set the child into the crib, a strong gust of wind blows through the room. She places the baby down and rushes to the window and closes it shut. It must have been left cracked open by mistake. Brr, the room is cold from the wind, but she has just the thing to fix that. She moves to a small closet and opens the creaky door. The little old woman strains to reach up to the top shelf and feels around. Ah, there it is. She pulls down a baby blanket, a soft baby blue with colorful animals printed on it. It looks as though it's been up there for a long time, and she gives it a good shake before walking back to the crib. Look what we have here. It's your daddy's own blankie. She gives it another shake. There we go. Good as new. She leans into the crib and wraps the small helpless child in the blanket before giving him a gentle kiss on the forehead. Now you get some sleep. Your mommy and daddy will be back before you know it, and we want to show them what a good babysitter Grammy is, don't we? That way I get to see you all the time. The little old woman switches off the light and exits the room, leaving the door cracked just a few inches. She heads back to the couch and plops down on it. Almost as soon as she does, though, the baby starts crying. With a sigh, she gets back up and goes back to the nursery. What's the matter, little dear? She says as she turns the lights on. Oh no, she rushes to the crib. You've kicked your blanket off. You must be freezing. She grabs the blanket from the end of the crib and tucks it around the baby once again. There you go, that's better. The old woman leaves the room and quietly closes the door shut, leaving it open just a few inches. The moment she turns around to go back to the couch, though, the crying starts again. With a sigh, she opens the door and goes back into the room. Once again, the blanket is stuffed at the end of the crib where the baby has kicked it off. Fine, don't want a blanket, that's fine. She picks the baby up out of the crib and rocks him in her arms until it stops crying. She sets him back in the crib. There you go. No blankets. Just please get some sleep. Grammy's tired. The old woman takes the blanket out of the crib and leaves the room. She closes the door most of the way and, incredibly, this time the child remains silent. The old woman resumes her place on the couch and starts to yawn. Just as she does, the wind outside picks up and howls loudly. The old woman shivers. She looks next to her and spots the baby blanket. She picks it up and examines the cute animal print remembering when her own son was a baby wrapped in it. She smiles at the happy thought and throws the blanket around her shoulders. She leans back on the couch and finds that her eyes are growing very heavy. She'll rest them for just a moment. She won't fall asleep, she'll just rest. Mom, it's us, we're back. Thanks again for... The couple both scream when they enter the house to find that the old woman is lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood. The source of the blood is obvious. Chunks of flesh from her shoulders and upper back have been torn out, leaving jagged holes, as if she were mauled by an animal. As the man runs to the old woman, trying to do anything he can to help her, the woman runs to the nursery to find that the baby is sleeping peacefully in his crib. The woman picks up the child, tears streaming down her cheeks, and returns to the living room to see her husband kneeling beside his dead mother. Both the husband and wife are so shocked by what they have found that neither notices the baby blanket lying on the couch or that the cruel, blood-covered mouth on it is slowly fading from view until it disappears completely. There is little in life that is more comforting than a favorite blanket. Perhaps you've had the same one since you were a child, or you have a heavy one that you'd like to wrap yourself in when you're feeling down, or maybe it's just one that's especially fluffy and warm that you'd do anything to keep. Today's anomaly plays on those very feelings, using them against its victims to become one of the more insidious predatory anomalies in the SCP Foundation archives. This is SCP-799, also known as the Carnivorous Blanket. SCP-799 is a type of creature that can vary in shape, size, and appearance, but, as the name implies, always takes the form of a blanket of some kind. The exact material the anomaly is made out of is unknown, but it is a very soft fiber that in many ways resembles a high-quality merino wool blend. 
though one that retains heat even more effectively than its natural counterpart. SCP-799's weight can vary from between half a kilogram all the way to six kilograms, and while examples have been found in nearly every color imaginable, it seems predisposed towards pastels and will frequently have patterns featuring stylized, friendly depictions of various animals. Both the pastel colors and the childish patterns are especially common in instances of SCP-799 that weigh less than 2 kilograms and would colloquially be known as baby blankets. While SCP-799 is undoubtedly a living organism, there is some debate as to whether it is itself an animal or perhaps a type of fungal colony. Instances of 799 are incapable of locomotion, lying motionless for long periods of time and require little in the way of nutrition. What small amount they do need, they appear to be able to gain almost entirely from the organic particles present in normal household dust, such as animal dander and dead human skin cells. The blanket feeds via a series of minute, filter-feeding mouth-like structures that are spread across the surface of the creature, which wait for nutrients to fall into them, not unlike a sponge on the ocean floor. Instances of SCP-799 can survive for quite a while in this state, and one specimen was noted as having lived for multiple years in a damp attic subsisting entirely on the small organic particles that would drift down from the rafters above. Should an instance of SCP-799 be forced to go for long periods of time without a source of nutrition though, like when, for example, it is placed inside of a sealed closet or drawer, it will begin to undergo certain physical changes which result in it metamorphosing into its predatory form. These changes aren't noticeable from only casual observation and consist of the blanket converting its many filter-feeding mouths into a single, large one that is lined with multiple rows of extremely sharp teeth. The blanket creature also develops a new form of tissue inside its cloth-like structure, one that is similar to muscle and capable of contracting and squeezing. Once its metamorphosis is complete, the instance of SCP-799 will lie in wait for an unsuspecting creature to cover themselves with it or wrap it around their body. Once they do, the blanket will bide its time until they enter a state of rest, usually waiting for them to fall asleep entirely, at which point its feeding phase will begin. Once the creature has detected that its victim is dormant, it will use its newly formed muscle to latch onto them, holding them in place as it opens its tooth-lined maw. It will begin to bite at its confined prey, tearing off several kilograms of flesh, bone, and any other organic material it can, swallowing it and converting it into a thin slurry that it spreads through its body almost immediately. This traumatic, violent process nearly always leads to the victim dying of blood loss. Within 10 minutes of the attack, the mouth on SCP-799 will have been completely reabsorbed, leaving no signs that it is anything other than a normal, everyday blanket, though one which now mysteriously weighs several kilograms more than it did before. By 40 minutes after the attack, the entire digestive system within SCP-799 will have demetamorphosed back into its original form, with a single digestive tract being changed once again to the many dispersed filter-feeding mouths. While SCP-799 is more than happy to feed on any warm-blooded animal, including humans, it shows no interest in cold-blooded ones or inanimate objects. It appears, then, that its senses may be limited to only touch and heat, using those as signs that it is now wrapped around a potential meal. Adding to the strangeness of SCP-799 is that it reproduces through budding, like flatworms and corals. When it has absorbed enough nutrients and sufficiently increased its mass, either very slowly through filter feeding or rapidly via its carnivorous phase, it will begin to take on a quilt-like appearance. Over several weeks, one of the quilt squares will puff up and slide off the blanket. This new, smaller instance will resemble a doily or a throw pillow, until it too begins to feed and grow. The new instance is a perfect clone of its parent, identical in every way, and it will eventually grow to a similar size and begin its own reproductive cycle. It is unknown exactly how long it takes SCP-799 to reach full maturity, but the current best guess is that when kept in its filter-feeding phase, an instance will reproduce every 50 to 60 years. Instances of SCP-799 are quite prevalent across the planet, and the SCP Foundation currently has hundreds of examples in containment. Unfortunately, it is unknown just how many still exist in the wild, as it is very difficult to identify instances, with one of the only reliable means being through genetic testing. Should any instances be located, though, they are to be destroyed immediately, as the Foundation already has a large enough population in containment for research purposes, and they pose too much of a risk both in terms of harm and exposure to the general public. SCP-799 has been classified as Euclid, 
and each instance is kept in its own separate biocontainment cell at Biosite 66. Dust is regularly collected from the on-site D-Class personnel dorms and is sprinkled over the blankets regularly to keep them in their filter feeding state, though only just enough to hopefully maintain their size and not allow them to reproduce. Should any small cloth objects appear in their containment lockers, it is to be removed immediately and contained separately. SCP-799 isn't the only predatory creature that resembles a cloth good in Foundation containment, and research into possible connections to SCP-1626, the oversized gray hooded sweatshirt that sends penetrating fibers into anyone unlucky enough to put it on, is ongoing. A man opens his mouth to bite a hot dog and suddenly freezes. His eyes widen, and the hot dog drops from his hand, falling to the ground. Ahead, a stampede of people is running toward him, screaming, crying out for help. Behind them, a man walks at an ordinary, casual pace, but something is off. His eyes have a glazed, unfocused look to them, and he keeps shoveling random items into his open mouth, swallowing them down. He eats a clipboard and pen, a discarded shoe, and as the first man watches in horror, the very hungry man grabs the ankle of a fallen member of the crowd and pulls him into his mouth, devouring him. The first man turns to run for his life, only to be knocked to the ground by the rest of the crowd, trying to escape. He struggles to climb back to his feet, and a hand reaches out to take his. When he makes it to his feet, he looks up and sees the hungry man pulling him in, mouth stretching open wide. The sky is a perfect, cloudless blue. The air is warm from the unbroken sunlight, but cooled to the perfect temperature by a gentle breeze, and there is a sense of electricity, excitement, and competition in the air. Throngs of people have gathered together in a makeshift arena, piled into plastic chairs and swarming around concession stands, all training their eyes on the arena's center. What are they here for? Some sort of Olympic Games? A baseball tournament? A horse race? No, it's something greater. Something meatier. It is the annual Midsummer Hot Dog Eating Contest, and locals and tourists alike are coming together to see just who can cram the most pork or beef hot dogs and buns down their gullets in front of a roaring crowd. The announcer makes his way to the front of the arena, standing with his arms wide in front of the long table behind him. As he calls out the names of this year's contestants, they file in, each taking his place behind the table. There is the previous year's champion, a burly man with a bushy beard and twinkling eyes, and there is this year's surprise competitor, a skinny 19-year-old college student with a hungry grin. Then there are the lesser-known contestants, a local father who signed up after making a joke with his daughter an uncle who scrawled his name on the sign-up sheet after a few too many drinks, a recently retired man checking off another item on his golden year's bucket list. All have come to the event today with full hearts and empty stomachs, ready to see who the year's victor will be. The announcer riles up the crowd, encouraging them to cheer as loudly as possible to spur on their chosen competitor. All the while, staff are carrying out trays piled high with hot dogs, more hot dogs than most people see in a year, except for the people who just really, really love hot dogs. Each contestant receives a tray of hot dogs, a bucket of water, and an additional empty bucket, just in case, well, you get the idea. With the supplies and competitors all in place, it is time to begin the countdown. The announcer holds up his favorite air horn and calls out, Three, two, one, eat! At the sound of the air horn's blast, the men leap into action, seizing hot dogs from plates and each engaging in their unique competitive eating technique. The previous year's champion employs the method of famous hot dog eating champion Joey Chestnut, dunking his entire hot dog sloppily into his water, then swallowing it as quickly as possible. The new challenger, on the other hand, employs the Solomon method, named for King Solomon. Much like the fabled king suggested doing with a stolen infant, eaters using the Solomon method break the focus of their feasting in half before polishing it off. One of the more casual competitors attempts a divide-and-conquer technique, eating first the dog itself and then the bun. Others employ no specific technique at all, attempting to devour the stack of hot dogs before them, using the same classic eating style they might employ at a family barbecue. This is a grave mistake. One by one, the less prepared competitors drop out, spitting into their buckets, wiping meat sweats from their foreheads, waddling out of the arena while groaning and holding their aching stomachs. Soon, only the two front runners remain. But what's this? A challenger approaches. An unassuming black man, clad in a shirt and dress pants, rushes into the arena, his face a mask of single-minded determination, and begins seizing the discarded hot dogs off the table, gobbling them up as fast as he can. The announcer and the rest of the audience watch in stunned disbelief. This is unprecedented, 
and as exciting as it is, definitely against the rules. This man is not a registered competitor, and he certainly can't join the contest in the champion stretch. Unsure of what else to do, the announcer beckons to the staff on the sidelines, ushering them back toward the table to clear the food and escort this surprise drop-in out of the arena. The audience watches with rapt attention as the staff members attempt to remove the stranger from his place at the table. He shakes his head violently, refusing to go, and snatches the hot dogs away from them even as they try to clear the trays away. All the while, the remaining competitors standing are attempting to stay the course and finish strong in spite of the interruption. The new, younger man collapses, slumping down onto the table in a hot dog-induced stupor. He has tapped out. The victor is the previous year's champion, with a staggering ultimate tally of 38 hot dogs. As four staff members work together to wrestle the stranger out of the arena, the champion steps forward to receive his trophy. The crowd roars as he holds up his arms, grinning ear to ear and basking in yet another win. The announcer can still see the staff struggling with the stranger out of the corner of his eye, but this crowd wants to see their champion crown, and the show must go on. So he grabs the Hot Dog King sash, the crown made from gold, well, gold-plated, hot dogs, and even the massive gold trophy. He crowns the winner, placing the sash over his shoulders. Then, as the music swells triumphantly, courtesy of the local high school marching band, the announcer holds up the trophy, sunlight glinting off its shiny surface. It represents so many things, achievement, celebration, the ability to eat just so much meat and not get sick, and now it is time for it to be awarded to the man who earned it. The announcer stretches his arms, handing over the trophy to the contest winner, when all of a sudden, another hand grabs hold of its handle, ripping it from the announcer's grasp. The stranger has returned, somehow freeing himself from the multiple security guards who escorted him away and he has taken the trophy for himself. But he isn't just attempting to crown himself the hot dog king. No, this is not a simple coup de hot dog. He lifts the trophy up over his head, opening his mouth as wide as it will go, and tears the metal in half with a horrible screeching sound, shoving the pieces into his mouth, chewing and swallowing. By the time the announcer and the champion recover from their shock enough to move again, the trophy is completely gone, vanished into the stranger's belly. After a day of seemingly impossible feats of feasting, the sight of this strange man consuming a truly impossible meal of metal is just too much for the already anxious crowd to take. The arena erupts into absolute chaos as people spill out of their seats en masse, fleeing the area. The champion, however, does not turn and run. He feels robbed of his victory. Though it may have occurred in an utterly bizarre fashion, he won't stand for this kind of disrespect. He has trained all year for this moment, only to watch his trophy be eaten right in front of him. He marches right up to the stranger and pokes him in the chest, demanding to know who he thinks he is, what gives him the right to crash the hot dog eating contest, interrupt the proceedings, and upstage his victory by chowing down on the trophy. The man doesn't answer him, so the champion continues to berate him, wagging his finger in his face. The stranger's eyes follow the finger, and slowly he opens his mouth. There is a sudden chop and the champion screams, holding his hand to his chest, using his shirt to stem the bleeding. He turns to run with the rest of the crowd, but it's too late. The stranger's hand clamps down on his shoulder, holding him in place with a surprising strength. The only thing he sees before his life is snuffed out is the stranger's wide open mouth, before everything goes dark with another sickening chomp. All the while, the crowd's terror rises to a fever pitch at the horrible sight. They trample each other as they scramble to vacate the area, shoving strangers and loved ones alike out of the way in a bid to escape this mysterious equal opportunity omnivore with an appetite for far more than just hot dogs. Some manage to escape, running far enough from the arena that they can stop to catch their breaths and glance back at the ones who were not so lucky. Those who tripped and fell in the madness, who had the wind knocked out of them by an elbow to the gut from one of their neighbors, those with weak ankles or who hadn't tied their shoes carefully enough, all of these poor, unfortunate souls are next on the menu for the stranger. He devours them one by one, rarely even stopping to chew. As one surviving woman watching from a distance pulls out her phone to call 911, she can't escape noticing the parallels to the contest itself, the way the stranger eats with a singular focus on consuming as much as possible. There's no pause to enjoy the meal, but there is no sadism or malice in the act either, just the sheer, undeniable drive to keep eating. The woman's call to the police is one of the strangest moments of her life and utterly baffles the local police department. Ma'am, please calm down, one officer repeats again and again. What do you mean there's a man eating people? I mean exactly what I said, she shouts. A man showed up at the hot dog contest and started eating people. Please, you have to do something. 
I think this is above our pay grade, miss. Another officer chimes in. You think we should call, you know, the first officer trails off. Who? Who? The woman demands, but the line goes dead before she can ask another question. The police are clearly no help, and she isn't about to stick around and see just how big this stranger's appetite is. She tried to save the others, but now she needs to save herself. She runs all the way home without another glance back. Meanwhile, the local police did make that mysterious call, and an SCP Foundation mobile task force is currently en route to the scene. By the time they arrive, the park is a ghost town, with nothing but the blood-stained grass and abandoned arena to suggest that something horrible ever happened here at all. But these aren't some bumbling local police officers who have no idea what to do with a man-eating anomaly. This team has seen enough bizarre sights to fill a lifetime, and another lifetime after that. They spy a trail of sticky red footprints leading away from the arena. At first, they assume that the substance is blood, but a closer examination reveals that it is, in fact, ketchup. They track the savory footprints away from the scene of the day's unsavory events, following them to a nearby warehouse. Judging from the scattered wooden beams, rustling metal, and boarded up windows, this place has been abandoned for some time. The perfect place for an anomaly to hide away. If they weren't certain, the sound of someone inside biting through sheets of metal is plenty of indication that this is the right place. With no time to waste, they break down the door of the warehouse, weapons drawn and ready. They follow the sound of the chewing, splitting up to apprehend the subject from all available directions. The shriek of tearing metal echoes through the building, bouncing off the walls and creating a cacophony that is difficult to track. They do their best to follow the sound, but quickly veer off in separate directions in an attempt to cover as much ground as possible. One operative confronts the stranger just as he is reaching for another piece of metal. He watches as the man takes a massive bite out of the steel, a bite that should have shattered his teeth and broken his jaw. Instead, a cartoonish bite mark is taken out of the metal. He approaches the stranger, who, upon locking eyes with him, begins to shake his head, still chewing. The MTF operative ignores this visual cue, approaching the man and attempting to physically restrain him. This, like the confrontation with the champion before, is cut off with a fateful chomp and the operative screams ringing out through the warehouse, alerting his teammates to his unfortunate fate. The screams suddenly go silent, and another MTF operative stops cold, listening as the sound of chewing draws nearer and nearer. He spins around to face the presence behind him and spots the stranger standing there. The otherwise ordinary man is polishing off the tip of a steel beam, grimacing as he swallows it. The operative lifts his weapon, pointing it at the subject. The operative tells him to stand down and come quietly. The hungry man pleads wide-eyed for the operative to turn and run while he still can. He takes small, reluctant steps toward the operative, muttering that he can't stop. The operative brandishes his weapon again, barking another order for the man to stop. Before he can make another move, the stranger snatches the weapon out of his hand, opens his mouth, and swallows it. He winces as he does, but does not stop until the weapon is completely devoured. All at once, he lets out a loud belch, his knees buckle, and he slumps to the ground. He rubs his stomach, wipes his brow, and sighs heavily. I'm so sorry about that. I was just so hungry I couldn't help it. The man shakes his head sadly. I hope you can get a new weapon. And I'm sorry about your friend, too. You said you couldn't help it. Why'd you stop? The stranger shrugs, sighs again, and simply says, Well because I was full. After a bit of convincing, and a test confirming that the subject's strength and bite force has returned to ordinary human levels, the remaining mobile task force agree to bring him into Foundation custody unharmed, though restrained. They pile into one of the SCP Foundation's trademark unmarked vans and set off toward the nearest Foundation site. About one hour into the trip, the subject begins to lament his growling stomach, asking if they could possibly stop somewhere for a bite to eat. Ordinarily, this is against protocol, but after what happened to their teammate, the task force members aren't taking any chances. They pull into a fast food drive through and permit the subject to order whatever he wants. They'll declare it as a business expense later. Five burgers, five fries, five tacos, five pies, five cokes, ten tater tots, ten tenders, five shakes, five pancakes, five jalapeno poppers, and five baked potatoes later, the task force successfully reached the Foundation site with their newest subject, SCP-913. SCP-913 appears to be an average African-American man around middle age. Though his appearance is completely ordinary, his metabolism is unnaturally fast. He requires the recommended daily caloric intake for an average human being every two hours and has an unusually high internal temperature, though the specific number has been redacted from his official file. If he does not meet his calorie requirement for a given two-hour period, 
he will enter a trance state in which he is unable to control himself. In this state, he will break down and ingest any solid matter in his line of sight. This includes matter that would ordinarily be indigestible, including wood, plastic, and metal. In this state, his appetite does not distinguish between living and non-living subjects. When he is in this hunger-driven state, he is aware of all his actions, but cannot stop himself, even when he eats dense materials that cause him extreme discomfort. If this state hits while the subject is sleeping, he will be forced awake. In addition to his anomalous appetite, SCP-913 can rend objects at an estimated force of 3,000 newtons and can bite objects with an estimated force of 5,000 newtons when eating them. Whenever he is not in his trance state, he cannot replicate this strength. An examination of SCP-913's liver tissue showed that it is capable of producing new enzymes in response to foreign material, allowing his body to digest matter that should be highly dangerous to consume. These enzymes metabolize the substrate at an efficiency of approximately 98%, detoxifying any drugs or toxins consumed by the subject during the hunger state or otherwise. This includes, but is not limited to, amnestics and anesthetics. When SCP-913 was first discovered, he was wearing a shirt and dress pants, both with the brand name Doctor's Orders sewn onto their tags. SCP-913 has no tattoos aside from one on his right calf, which reads, Mr. Hungry, from Little Misters by Dr. Wondertainment. Just in case you aren't aware, the Little Misters are a line of humanoid anomalies created by the mysterious Dr. Wondertainment Corporation, including the fish-headed Mr. Fish, the candy-coated Ms. Sweetie, and Mr. Life and Mr. Death, who is every bit as existentially upsetting as he sounds. The purpose of these creations is currently unknown, though, like many Dr. Wondertainment products, their existence invites endless speculation. SCP-913 must be contained in a customized humanoid containment cell lined with one meter thick carbon steel. 913 is to be provided standard furnishings for his containment cell, coinciding with the usual necessities for a comfortable humanoid dwelling. He may be given pre-recorded entertainment materials, such as concerts, films, and television shows upon request. The cell may be accessed via a reinforced carbon steel door. Once every two hours, SCP-913 is provided with one nutritional supplement as specified in Document 913-2. I attempted to locate a copy of 913-2 for further details on said nutritional supplement, but access to it appears to be limited to researchers assigned to SCP-913. While the subject is sleeping, nutrition is provided to SCP-913 via a central venous catheter that must be changed once every three months. These measures allow SCP-913 to receive the calories that he needs to avoid entering a hunger state, ensuring the safety of everyone on site as well as his own comfort. Like the rest of the Little Misters, SCP-913 presents a puzzle that may never be solved. I could spend my limited time on this earth wondering why Dr. Wondertainment would create a being that seems to serve no purpose other than eating as much as possible, lest he unwillingly destroy the environment around him. But I believe that would be a waste of time. Why does Dr. Wondertainment do anything that they do? Why create a woman who can turn men into candy soldiers? Why create an ordinary man with a fish head, a tiny top hat, and a Boston accent? The personal motivations of Dr. Wondertainment, whether they are an individual or a massive conglomerate, are as inscrutable to me as the meaning of life itself, or the reasons why a person would want to eat more than two hot dogs in one sitting. A bear mauling you to death, being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights, and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. 
These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent, and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten, as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading, and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait! He has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties, because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo-restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you, since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste, and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop but it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, 
They wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blond man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something to retort that he too was suffering all night. But he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water, and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this plan, and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blond man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. 
It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being, as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell, and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site-88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site-88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced 
with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlyle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlyle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flatus were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs, rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned-off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur-oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13 odor eaters are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. A young man is with a group of friends eating lunch in their college cafeteria. His friends are talking and laughing, but they soon notice that the young man has hardly said a word. He seems distracted by something. Sitting a few tables away is a young woman. She's eating by herself, and in fact, the whole table around her is empty. As he stares, one of the young man's friends leans over and tells him to snap out of it. 
that the young woman he is staring at is weird and he's better off leaving her alone. The young man doesn't think she looks weird. In fact, he thinks she looks nice. Plus, he's seen her in one of his classes and she doesn't seem strange, just shy. The young man's friends watch as he gets up from his table and goes to sit across from the young woman. She seems surprised when he tells her hi, as if she doesn't know what to say back. The young man tells her that he's seen her in his anatomy class and introduces himself to her, extending a hand. After a brief moment, she returns his handshake. She's seen him in the class too. The two start talking, having one of those awkward first conversations that happen with someone you like. They talk a bit about their class, they both find it very difficult, about their majors, both pre-med, and where they live, he on campus, her off. The young man needs to get going to his next class, but he asks if she wants to study together sometime. She seems hesitant, but then agrees to at least exchange phone numbers. The young man walks away from the table with a big smile on his face. That night, the young man is studying in his dorm. His roommate asks him if he wants to come with him to a party, but the young man tells him no, he has a big test coming up and he needs to focus on it. His roommate leaves and he checks his phone for the hundredth time that night. Still no messages. Just as he sets it back on his desk though, it chimes. There's a text. And it's from her. This stuff is really hard. Do you want to study together? The young man is excited. Of course he wants to study together. Where? Her apartment? Great! The young man doesn't waste any time, grabs his jacket and his books, and heads out. It's starting to snow lightly as he bikes to her apartment, which is a couple miles off campus. He's feeling a little nervous as he locks up his bike and walks to her door. He knocks, and the door opens. There she is, the young woman, looking just as nice as she did in the cafeteria. The young woman shows him into her apartment. She offers him a glass of wine before they sit down and get to studying. In between quizzing each other on the human circulatory system, the two chat, getting to know each other a little better. Eventually, she tells him that she has something she needs to ask him. She wants to know if he thinks she's weird. The young man is taken aback and answers no, not at all. She tells him that she knows it sounds stupid, but when she was younger, the rumor went around her school that she was some kind of witch. She didn't know if maybe someone from her childhood was still spreading that story around. The young man hadn't heard that, but he wanted to know why someone would think that. Because you do dumb stuff when you're a kid, she tells him. You read about a ritual in an old book and try it just for fun. Nothing happens, of course, but don't tell anyone that you tried or you'll never live it down. They look outside, and the snow has really started to fall. It's getting late, too. Does he want to stay the night? The young man would love to. The bike ride back to campus will be much easier in the morning. She tells him to wait just a minute and goes into her bedroom. The young man is nervous. He's never been in this kind of situation before, if it even is a situation at all. He's never had a girlfriend or even kissed a girl before. Could tonight be the night? The bedroom door opens and the young woman comes out with blankets and pillows for the couch. She tells him to make himself comfortable and she'll see him in the morning. The young man is disappointed, but what did he expect? She just wanted someone to study with. It was dumb of him to think that she might like him just because he had a little crush on her. Maybe they'll be great friends, though. The young man lies on the couch and watches the snow fall outside. It's so peaceful and quiet here, not like the dorm where someone is always making noise. He watches snowflakes pass by the window as his eyes start to grow heavy, and he drifts to sleep. What was that? The young man jolts up. He could have sworn he heard something. He listens, but now there is only silence. He lies back down and closes his eyes. It must have been a dream. No, there it is again. A popping noise. Then more sounds, snapping and ripping like moist meat squished and torn. What is going on? The young man gets up off the couch and looks around. It sounds like it's coming from the bedroom. Her bedroom. The door is closed, though. There don't appear to be any lights on. But the strange sounds continue. The young man doesn't know what's happening in there, but he feels extremely nervous. He takes a step towards the door and the noises stop. What should he do? Will she be mad if he knocks? But what if something is happening in there? What if she needs his help? He has to risk it. He needs to check that everything is alright. The young man knocks lightly on the door. No response. He knocks a little harder. Hello? Are you okay? Still nothing. Is he really going to do this? His heart is pounding. He grips the doorknob and slowly twists it cracking the door open ever so slightly. It's dark in her room. A small beam of moonlight coming through the frosty window is the only source of light. He opens the door a bit wider. I hope it's okay if I come in, he says. I heard something and... The young man freezes in terror. 
lying there on the bed, illuminated by the moonlight, is the girl. But not the whole girl. It's just her body. Her head has been ripped off at the neck. Unfortunately, this student will never get ahead in his anatomy class, because even something as innocent as a study date can turn bad quickly when your partner is the strange and dangerous creature which many refer to as the Penangalan, but is better known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-1060. SCP-1060 is the designation given to the human female, both body and head included, who answers to the name Adila. In interviews with the subject, she has reported her age as being 22 years old, and she is fluent in the Malay language, with some additional proficiency in Malaysian English, which is a form of English that, unsurprisingly, combines elements of British English and Malaysian. The subject has told interviewers that she is trained as an obstetrics nurse, also known as an OB, a type of nurse that specializes in helping to care for women and fetuses during pregnancy, labor, and childbirth. It would seem at first glance that SCP-1060 is a completely normal young woman, and that is true, but only during the day. At night, SCP-1060 undergoes some rather strange changes to her physiology. In the evening, roughly 80 minutes after SCP-1060 has fallen asleep, her head and certain internal organs, including her heart, lungs, liver, and the majority of her digestive system, will physically detach from the rest of her body. This occurs with a sudden jerking motion that rips the head and organs from the body leaving a large gaping hole in the subject's neck. The now detached head and trailing organs will begin to levitate through a process that has yet to be explained by SCP Foundation researchers. They will begin to float around the room they are in, as other physical changes take place. The subject's tongue will increase in size to roughly 22 centimeters in length and will begin flicking at the air much in the same way that a snake does. The subject's upper and lower canine teeth also increase in both size and sharpness. All while the body her head was once firmly affixed to will remain lying in the same position as when the head detached. If there is food present, SCP-1060 will use its dangling intestines as a sort of prehensile limb, lifting the food with its guts up into its mouth where it will tear at it with its razor-sharp teeth. Once it is finished feeding, the disembodied head will dip its exposed organs into a tub of rice wine vinegar. Exposing the organs to the vinegar has an immediate effect causing them to shrink in size, such that they will then fit into the exposed neck hole on the waiting, headless body and can be stuffed back into the body cavity. The head then appears to seamlessly reattach itself to the body. The tongue and teeth return to their normal size, and no signs remain that the head of this body was just floating around of its own volition moments ago. SCP-1060 claims to have no knowledge that any of this takes place, insisting that she sleeps quite normally. Her complete unawareness of her condition has led her to be very insistent that she be released from Foundation containment, and frequently requests that she be allowed to contact her family members. So far, both of these requests have been denied. A head that rips itself from its own body at night and flies around with its exposed organs dangling beneath it is an extremely unsettling image. But this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what makes SCP-1060 truly horrifying. Just as the many Malay legends and myths describe, this creature's favorite foods are children and unborn fetuses carried by pregnant women. The Foundation learned this fact in a particularly unsettling incident, which has been designated SCP-1060.01A. During this incident, a researcher who was in her second trimester of pregnancy entered the containment chamber of SCP-1060 while it was engaged in its nighttime cycle behavior in order to refill the basin of vinegar that would allow it to return to its complete human form. Despite not having previously shown aggressive behavior towards staff, as soon as the researcher entered the chamber, SCP-1060 immediately flew at her. It used its dangling intestines to restrain the researcher, and results were not pretty. Sadly, neither the researcher nor the fetus that she was carrying survived. Following this incident, the containment procedures for SCP-1060 were updated to specify that members of staff who are pregnant or suspect that they may be pregnant are not allowed into the containment chamber during its nighttime cycle. While the origins of SCP-1060 and just how this young woman came to possess these anomalous properties are unknown, there are numerous tales, most originating from Malaysian folklore, that describe a creature that is quite similar. Known as the Penangalan, it is a creature akin to a vampire, though with one key difference. 
this monster chose to become what it is. Malaysian myths tell of a method some women use to become Penangalan, where they will meditate while taking a ritual bath in vinegar. Their entire body must be submerged except for their head, and through a black magic process, they gain the ability to have their head detach from their body and turn into something that looks quite similar to SCP-1060. Some modern interpretations of the legend describe it not as a choice, but as a curse, or as the result of breaking a demonic pact, but they all have the same result for the woman in question. As SCP researchers continue to look into this bizarre and quite dangerous anomalous entity, she is kept contained in a humanoid observation and detention cell at all times in Site-33. While she is in her complete human form during the day, she is given food from the on-site cafeteria, but during her nighttime phase, she is provided with 0.8 kilograms of human placental material, and she is to have access to a basin that contains at least 4 liters of rice wine vinegar. The lack of knowledge about just what this anomaly is and the threat it poses to certain populations has led to it being classified as Euclid, and though progress has been slow, it is hoped that one day it will be better understood, and perhaps once it is, Adila can finally go home. You're deep in the middle of a late night study session when you hear something. It's a sort of clicking sound. You try to ignore it and get back to your books, but there it is again. You turn up your music. There. That's better. It was probably nothing. Just the house creaking. But no, there it is again. You need to figure out what is causing this. You look around. Is it coming from outside your window? Another click. It's definitely coming from outside. You slowly make your way to the window. It's dark out, and you can't see anything with the glare. Slowly, you reach out, grab the window, pull it open, and… nothing. You stick your head out and look around, but there's nothing to see. You close the window and go back to studying, but then it happens again. The next morning, you're eating breakfast when you start to hear that clicking noise again, but still nothing is there. On the bus you could swear it's coming from the seat right behind you, no sign of anything once again. You're in the middle of your test, the vertebrae are connected to each other by… what's the word? It's not going quite as well as you hoped. It was hard to study last night with the constant clicking, but you're giving it your best. At least the noise has stopped so you can concentrate for a bit. You jump up and look behind you, determined to catch what's making this noise, but there's nothing there. You look around at your confused classmates before sheepishly sitting back down. The cracking noise is almost endless now. You can hardly go a moment without hearing it. It goes on like this for months and months. No one else can hear it and no one seems to believe you. On one level, you've been able to get used to it, but on another, you never have adjusted to the constant clicking that follows you everywhere you go. You're sitting on the floor of your room, concentrating, focusing hard, trying to will the noise out of your mind. You clench your eyes shut as hard as you can and put all of your mental energy towards stopping the noise, when just then, it's gone. No more clicks. You open your eyes. Could this be it? Could it all be over? You turn around to see it, but it's too late. What you have just witnessed is a textbook example of an SCP-4975 attack, an anomaly that has been aptly nicknamed Time's Up. SCP-4975 is a tall, thin entity with some vaguely avian features, most notably a beak. Its long limbs lack any distinct digits, instead tapering off into formless nubs, and a thick, hardened layer of dark skin covers its entire body, including its beak. In addition to its striking appearance, SCP-4975 is perhaps best known for the distinctive clicking sound that it makes. The vertebrae in its long neck are not connected by any intervertebral discs or other tendons, and each of these neck bones appears to be able to move independently of one another. It rotates these vertebrae constantly, one at a time, from bottom to top ending at its head, creating a constant swinging motion of the head back and forth. It is each movement of these vertebrae that produces the distinctive clicking or cracking sound. SCP-4975's primary behavior is the pursuit and stalking of human beings. Once it has chosen a target, for reasons that still remain unknown, it will begin to follow them, and only the target will be able to hear the clicking sound, though they won't be able to determine where the sound is actually coming from. 
SCP-4975 will continue to stalk its victims for an extended period of time, as long as 10 months or more, until at some point it stops swinging its head, the clicking sounds cease, and 4975 attacks. In an attack, SCP-4975 uses its long appendages to club and tear the victim apart, after which it will consume them, often starting while the victim is still alive. One single human-sized cadaver appears to be enough to last SCP-4975 for several months, after which it will target a new prey and begin the process all over again. Evidence of SCP-4975 has been found as far back as 1538, with a creature very similar to it appearing in numerous German folk tales. Multiple artistic depictions from the time also show a large, black avian creature that can only be assumed to be the same anomaly. In what should be a bit of good news, SCP-4975 is currently in containment at an SCP Foundation facility, where it is confined to a standard steel containment cell. However, as you'll soon see, this containment has not resulted in the end of SCP-4975 attacks, and reports of new incidents continue to come in. In one such report from the Black Forest region of Germany, Foundation agents were investigating the case of a local man who had reported that he had been hearing a rhythmic clicking sound for over four months. The man assumed he was being stalked, or was the subject of a cruel prank, and asked the local authorities to look into the matter. The Foundation agents took the man into custody, giving the cover story to the local police that the man had been experiencing auditory hallucinations and paranoia as a side effect of an experimental chemotherapy he had been receiving. The agents took the man to the last place he had heard the clicking sound, which was a wooded area. As they walked through the forest, the man grew increasingly nervous until he stopped and pointed at a tree, claiming that it was where the sound was coming from. The man froze in fear as the agents drew their weapons and prepared to inspect the tree. They split up and with a tactical efficiency circled the tree on either side to find… nothing. At the same time, the man screamed, pointing at a creature the agents could not see that the man claimed was coming for him. The man was thrown to the ground by his invisible assailant and struck multiple times. The agents attempted to attack where it seemed the invisible creature should be, but their fists and weapons passed through the air as if nothing was there. Another agent attempted to drag the man away, but he was pinned down by a mysterious force. A large wound began to appear on the man's midsection as his abdomen was opened up. Still unable to move the man or stop whatever it was that was attacking him, and with no other options, a Foundation agent took out his gun and terminated the man. Moments later, as the agents looked on, strips of flesh began to be torn from the body and vanish, as if an invisible creature was feeding on the deceased man. But this invisible attack wasn't even the strangest part. At the exact moment the man in Germany was killed and devoured by an unseen force, SCP-4975 was observed to be standing motionless, staring at the southeastern corner of its containment cell, and it was no longer clicking its neck. Any human contact with SCP-4975 has been disallowed, and all current research into the creature has been temporarily ceased, though it has been classified as Euclid. Following these continued attacks and the bizarre behavior it exhibits as they take place, reclassification to Keter class is pending. In the event that a containment breach takes place, it is official Foundation policy that any personnel who begin hearing a persistent, rhythmic cracking noise are to isolate themselves from other staff and calmly wait for SCP-4975 to be returned to its chamber, or for the noises to stop. Perhaps as you wait for the clicking noise to cease, you can amuse yourself with an old German nursery rhyme that is believed to have been written about SCP-4975. Its translation goes, Tick tock, the cuckoo clock ticks. Cuckoo the bird inside sings. As ticks the time, so ticks your heart. May you live long as you hear its song. Listen close, for when it stops, the hatchling comes out of its home. Did you hear it? Did it stop? My child, it meant your time was up. A businessman steps out of his hotel room holding a silver ice bucket. He looks up and down the empty hallway until he spots what he was searching for an ice machine. He slips his room key into his pocket and heads down the hall towards the machine. As he waits for the machine to fill his bucket with ice, he glances around and spots something. There at the end of the hall, it looks like someone is sticking their head out from around the corner, watching him. But then they suddenly disappear. He doesn't think much of it, 
It's probably just some kid playing around. His ice bucket is only a quarter full. These old machines can be really slow. He looks around again and sees the same head poking around the corner, looking at him. He thinks it might be a young girl, but as he squints to get a better look, she disappears around the corner once again. The ice machine finally finishes filling his bucket. He picks it up and starts to walk back towards his room, but stops. He turns around and looks down the hall to see the same girl there again, watching him with a creepy, unblinking stare. Do you want something? The man asks down the hallway, but there's no response from the girl. She simply keeps looking at him. Are you just going to keep staring at me? That's exactly what she does. The businessman is really starting to get annoyed now. All he wanted to do was unwind with a drink after a long day at a job site. Why does this girl want to keep messing with him? He starts walking down the hall towards her. I don't know what you think you're playing at, the businessman says as he walks down the hallway in her direction. When he gets halfway to her, she disappears behind the corner once again. But the businessman keeps walking and talking to her. But if you don't stop messing with me, I'll... He rounds the corner and sees... Nothing. There's a short hallway that leads to a maintenance closet, but no girl. Did she somehow slip inside the closet? He didn't hear the door, but she couldn't be anywhere else. He sets down the ice bucket on the floor and reaches towards the handle with more than a little apprehension. He feels uneasy for some reason, and huh? maybe even a little scared. Huh? But there's nothing to be afraid of. It was just a girl, wasn't it? He grabs the handle and opens the door. Aha! I've got you. There's nothing in the closet. Just a couple of mops, a bucket, and some cleaning supplies. He pushes the mops aside as if she could somehow be hiding behind them, but no. There's no place to hide or secret doors to be found. He really must have imagined the whole thing. It was a long day, and a long flight before that. He needed that drink. He sticks his room key into the door and pulls it out. A green light flashes and the lock clicks open. He grabs the handle to open the door, when he realizes he's forgotten something. The ice bucket, the whole reason he left his room to begin with. He walks back down the hallway and past the ice ma Wait a second. Where's the ice machine? Isn't this where it was? The alcove where he could have sworn he got ice just minutes before is empty. He looks around, up and down the hallway. Did he somehow get turned around? He walks to the end of the hall and turns the corner. Sitting there on the floor in front of the maintenance closet door is the ice bucket. He looks around, confusion on his face, and picks up the ice bucket. Back at his room, he puts his room key into the door. The lock flashes red. He tries the key again, and once more it flashes red. He tries the key a third time, and as he does so, the door opens. He looks up to see a large man standing in front of him. Do you need something? The businessman is confused. What are you doing in my room? He asks. Your room? The large man responds. Yeah, room 237. The large man looks annoyed. He shoves past the businessman and points across the hall. The businessman follows his finger's direction to see that he's pointing at another door, one that has the number 237 next to it on the wall. The businessman looks at the number next to the door he's been trying to unlock, 239. The businessman laughs nervously at his mistake as the large man pushes past him again and closes the door behind him. Back in his room, the businessman can finally sit down and pour himself a drink. He takes two ice cubes from the bucket and drops them in his glass before taking a long sip. Ah. He turns on the TV, but after watching for a few minutes, he finds that he's having a hard time concentrating. Whatever this show is, it moves too fast and he can't keep track of what's happening. He turns off the TV and picks up a book instead. Maybe some reading will help him to relax and get his bearings. He still feels really… off. He opens the book, but gets confused. Is this the same book he bought in the airport? It looks like it's written in a foreign language. It's just a bunch of squiggles. He tosses the book on the table and yawns. It's not that late, but he's feeling really tired. He gets up, kicks off his shoes, and lies down on the bed without bothering to undress. He's too tired for that. He mumbles to himself for a moment, half awake, talking about how he needs to return that foreign book when he goes back to the airport. What were they trying to do selling him something he can't even read? He continues to mumble about the things he'll do to the cashier who sold him the book for a while until he finally drifts off to sleep. His eyes open. It's dark. He must have been sleeping for a while. The room is cold, too. He goes to pull the blankets up over him, but immediately realizes that he can't move. Try as he might, his body won't respond. Not a single muscle. Only his eyes seem to work. He's completely paralyzed. He can't even yell for help. What happened? And what is he going to do? Did he have a stroke? Is he dying? 
As his mind races through all the different possibilities, he suddenly sees something. From his bed in the dark room, he can just barely make out the door to his hotel room, and he is terrified by what he can see coming through it. A figure has appeared in the door, literally in the door, as if it is phasing through the solid wood. The man is scared to death as the thing fully enters his room and turns to look right at him. The man wants to scream, but his mouth is still completely numb. The figure starts crawling towards him. He can see now that it's small, smooth, and completely white. He fights as hard as he can, willing his body to move, but nothing happens. He can't so much as whisper. The thing climbs up onto the bed and sits down right on his chest. He prays that he is dreaming, telling himself to wake up over and over again as the creature leans his face in close to his. It seems as if it is somehow looking at him with its smooth, eyeless sockets. It tilts its head slightly to the side and… Welcome, I'm Dr. Bob, and we couldn't be happier that you've decided to stay with us as we delve into SCP-5172, an extremely dangerous anomaly that is known by the extremely non-threatening name of… North American Hotel Ice Machines. SCP-5172 is a phenomenon that only affects guests staying at hotels located on the North American continent. It is unknown how or what causes these guests to become affected, but those that are will begin to notice something. Ice machines in the hallway of the hotel they are staying in. Now you might think this sounds perfectly normal. After all, don't most hotels have ice machines? If you just had this thought, then I have some bad news for you because there is a high probability that you too may have been affected by SCP-5172. You see, ice machines are actually extremely uncommon in hotels, and it is likely that you have never actually seen one, or at least, not a real one. Allow me to explain. In the 1950s, the founder of the Holiday Inn chain of hotels, Kenan Williams, had an idea that he thought would set his hotel apart and attract customers, which was to offer more perks and amenities than his competitors. For example, he implemented a new policy where children would be allowed to stay for free, something most hotels charged extra for. Hotels at the time also had a policy of making their guests pay for ice, but Williams decided to change that by installing ice machines in his hotels. Sadly, the marketing stunt didn't work. The cost of the machines wasn't made up for in new customers, and the plan was discontinued by the mid-1960s. The vast majority of the machines were removed, with the rest being pulled from the hotels as they would break down since they were no longer worth the expense of maintaining. Despite the fact that they only existed in hotels for a brief period of time, there is still a widely held belief among the public that ice machines can be found in nearly every hotel. In a poll of the general population conducted by the Foundation, over 80% of adults claim to have memories of seeing an ice machine in a hotel, a number that is quite literally impossible. Just where this mass delusion came from, or why it persists, is currently unknown, but it's theorized to be related to the SCP-5172 phenomenon in some way. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-5172 in 1973 after a series of unsolved murders occurred at hotels in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Foundation investigators soon discovered the prevalence of false ice machine memories and installed a number of hidden cameras around the hotels in both their public spaces as well as in the rooms themselves. It was after viewing the footage captured by these cameras that the Foundation finally got their first look at just what happens during an occurrence of SCP-5172, which has been dubbed a Zalmunna event. The Zalmunna event is triggered whenever a guest at the hotel sees and then uses an ice machine. The moment they use the ice machine, the event cannot be stopped unless certain actions are taken, but more on that later. The targeted individual who used the ice machine will immediately begin to have the sense that they are being watched. This usually comes in the form of an unknown individual who appears to be looking at them from the end of the hall where the ice machine is located. Third-party observers are unable to see the person who is supposedly watching the target, nor do they appear on any recording devices, visual or otherwise. The targets have described the watchers in various ways, leading the Foundation to believe that they may actually be nothing more than hallucinations. Shortly after, the targeted individual will begin to experience feelings of confusion and fatigue, not dissimilar to the symptoms of early-stage dementia. The longer it takes the target to return to their hotel room, the more pronounced these feelings will become, and they will soon have issues completing everyday tasks and will experience short-term memory loss. Despite these feelings of fatigue and disorientation, Targets report that their mind feels too active to fall asleep, anywhere other than a hotel room bed, that is. This feeling will usually cause the target to seek out their own hotel room, though they may have difficulty finding it due to their confused state. 
They don't need to sleep in their own room for the next stage of the Zalmunna event to be triggered, though. Sleeping in any hotel room will do. Once the target lies down in a hotel room bed, they will immediately enter the hypnagogic state, which is the confusing and dreamlike state that one experiences in between full sleep and waking. The temperature of the room will begin to lower during this period as well, until it reaches approximately 11 degrees Celsius or 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit. After about an hour, the target will enter a state of deep sleep, at which point SCP-5172-1 will finally make its appearance. The humanoid-like entity is quite diminutive in size, standing just 4 feet tall and appearing to weigh a little over 60 pounds. Its arms are twice as long as normal humans, though, and the top of its head is enlarged as well. Though it is not visible to observers present in the room, cameras are able to record the creature. After phasing through the door of the hotel room, the 5172-1 entity will begin crawling towards the sleeping person, who will wake up to find that they are in a state of sleep paralysis. The entity will climb up onto the bed and sit on the person's chest. It will move its smooth-skinned face close to the targets before opening its mouth, revealing a long, thin, proboscis-like appendage that it inserts into the target's eye socket. It's long been theorized that it may be administering some type of paralytic or anesthesia directly into the brain, so that it can then engage in the next stage of the Zalmana event, harvesting. The 5172-1 entity's chest then opens to reveal a pair of tools. It will take the tools out of its chest and use them to begin extracting four centimeter cubes directly from the target's body. Flesh, muscle, organs, and even bone will all be cut and scooped out with the same ease, which it then places inside of its own chest cavity. While it starts the process extremely slow, collecting just two cubes per minute at first, it quickly ups its pace to as many as 50 cubes per minute, leading to the entire harvesting process typically lasting two to three hours. Once it has finished harvesting, the creature will simply place its tools back inside its chest cavity, crawl back towards the hotel room door, and phase through it once more. But the horror is far from over. SCP-5172-1 collects all of the organic material from the target during the harvesting process, all except for the central nervous system, which includes the spinal cord, peripheral nerves, the retinas, and the brain. These are left lying on the hotel room bed after 5172-1 carefully cut and scooped around them. And the truly horrifying aspect of the Zalmana event is that the target is still alive at this point and will continue to live for several more hours in this condition. Even worse, reports from targets who had the Zalmana event interrupted while in the middle of the harvesting process described being fully conscious the entire time. It now appears that the proboscis-like appendage that 5172-1 inserts into the target's eye does not appear to be an anesthetic agent at all, since the same rescued targets reported feeling excruciating pain. Instead, it seems that the purpose of the entity's appendage is to ensure that the victim stays conscious through the whole process, fully aware of each cube being removed from their body, helpless to do a thing to stop it. As mentioned, the triggering of a Zalmana event is not a guaranteed death sentence and can be stopped. While much faster than humans, SCP-5172-1 entities aren't especially strong and sustain damage much like a human would. Once it begins harvesting, the entity will become visible to others and can be terminated by the same methods that would kill a human, such as with gunshots or stab wounds. However, simply killing the entity isn't enough. The affected ice machine must be physically removed from the premises in order to prevent a new instance of SCP-5172-1 from materializing. Once triggered through the use of an affected ice machine, the only way to completely stop a Zalmana event is for the target to leave the hotel and sleep in a private residence, which will prevent SCP-5172-1 from appearing. If the target sleeps in any bed in the same or even a different hotel, the event will continue. Efforts are underway to better understand SCP-5172-1 entities by capturing a live specimen, but so far, all attempts have resulted in failure. Captured entities are capable of manifesting their tools and cutting out of containment, while all attempts at binding or otherwise tying down the creatures has led to them dying within several minutes. Autopsies of dead instances have revealed that, like us, they have a circulatory system, though its heart is located in its head, which explains how they can be killed by being shot or stabbed, but they lack respiratory and digestive organs. As you can imagine, the existence of SCP-5172 presents a problem for Foundation personnel and their business travel. 
Agents who must stay in hotels rather than SCP safe houses are briefed on the anomaly and required to wear heart rate monitors that can detect when an elevated heart rate occurs that may be connected to a Zalmana event. Social media, text messages, and other forms of communication from devices that are connected to hotel Wi-Fi systems are monitored at all times for any references to ice machines, and any mention triggers the dispatching of a containment team to the site who will attempt to identify and remove both the ice machine and the targeted individual from the premises. All ice machines discovered at locations thought to be affected by SCP-5172 are then relocated to Site-30. One final note. While SCP-5172 has long been thought to be a North American exclusive phenomenon, there has recently been one confirmed instance of an affected ice machine in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Making it even stranger is the fact that the Dutch do not seem to have the same mass public perception of the prevalence of hotel ice machines that North Americans do. And it is still unclear if this was a single isolated event or a sign that the Keter class anomaly is spreading to other locations. Only time will tell. But in the meantime, even if you're staying outside of North America and want a frosty drink, consider paying the outrageous fees and grabbing an already cold one from the minibar. If you don't, you might find that you're paying for your refreshing beverage with much more than a pound of flesh. A construction worker puts the final nail into the wall of the room he's working on. He stands up and admires his work. This is going to be a beautiful hotel one day. A true triumph for not just him, but the entire country. And he's proud that he got to play a small part in its construction. He starts to pack up his tools. There's plenty more rooms that need work. It's a massive structure that will ultimately hold thousands. What a modern marvel. As he finishes putting away his tools, he notices something. Through the still doorless frame, he sees someone walk by in the hallway. Normally, he wouldn't think anything of it. There's plenty of other people working on this floor of the hotel, but there's something about this woman. Could it be? No, it's not possible. He takes out his wallet and opens it. Inside is a faded photograph of the construction worker when he was still a young man, barely more than a boy, really. Standing next to him in the picture is the most beautiful woman he had ever known. She was his first true friend, his best friend, and he always hoped that maybe it would turn into something more. They grew up together, shared so many experiences, but then ultimately they were separated and lost touch. He was never able to find her again, but as the picture in his wallet shows, he never stopped thinking about her. Could it really be her, though? He runs into the hallway and calls out. The woman stops at the end of the hallway and turns around. She's carrying a tall stack of boxes that are blocking her face. She sets them down and he sees that it really is her. They run towards each other, laughing like children, like the way they used to, and embrace in the middle of the hall. He can't believe it. It's been so many years. He never thought he would see her again. How long has it been? Too long, she tells him. He can't believe how little she's changed. The years have hardly taken any toll on her. She's just as lovely and beautiful as that last day he saw her. He asks her where she's been, what she's been doing. Is she married? She tells him no, and that after they lost touch, she feels like she has just been looking for him, waiting for the day she would randomly see him pass by on the street so that they could reconnect. She just never thought it would happen that they'd be working in the same place at the same time. The construction worker can't believe it either. They both start to ask each other something at the same time, but then stop and laugh at speaking over each other. You go first, he tells her. No, you, she responds with a laugh. Just then, they're both interrupted by the sound of a whistle. The work is finished for the day. That's the signal to pack up and go home. The construction worker tells her to wait there. He just has to go grab his tools and then the two of them can go down together. But as he turns to leave, she reaches out and grabs his hand. Wait, she tells him. He stops and turns back to her. It's okay, he tells her. I'll be right back. But she doesn't seem to want to let go of his hand. Please, not yet, she tells him. I just want you to stay with me. He looks down at his hand. She's gripping him so tight that it starts to hurt a little. Really, I'll just be a second, he tells her. Then we can go somewhere and catch up. But still, she won't let go of his hand. I need you, she tells him. She steps close to him, pressing her body against his. She closes her eyes and opens her mouth, and he feels himself doing the same. I've always needed you she says as their mouths are about to meet. I need you forever. The construction worker screams as the tiny tendrils emerge from the woman's body and plunge into his flesh. He opens his eyes to see the girl he once knew morphing into a writhing mass of fibers, each reaching out towards him. A long tentacle-like appendage wraps itself around his legs before whipping up and around his body, constraining him as a second tentacle wraps around his head, stifling his screams before popping his head off of his body. North Korea. 
It's a country that's shrouded in mystery, whose government, culture, and day-to-day -day life is a black box to many foreigners. But there's another secret inside, one that even the SCP Foundation is desperate to get to the bottom of, one that they know as SCP-031. SCP-031 is a massive organism, estimated to weigh more than 7,500 kilograms, that can currently be found in a very surprising location, the Ryugyong Hotel, which is located in Pyongyang, the capital of Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The giant creature lives within the ductwork and maintenance infrastructure of the building, where it has spread to all 105 floors of the hotel. Each of its many tendrils ends in a pod-like growth called a sporocarp, which are approximately 2 meters in length and covered in many cilia-like structures. Subjects have reported that when in the presence of these sporocarp, they don't see them as the writhing mass of organic matter that they really are, but rather as an individual from their past, often with one whom they shared an intense emotional attachment. When taking this form, the sporocarp will try to convince the subject to remain with them for an extended period of time. The sporocarp will then attempt to make physical contact with the subject, and if successful, its cilia-like structures will begin injecting digestive juices directly into the subject. This will lead to the start of a process that will eventually cause their flesh to be broken down, consumed, and then incorporated into SCP-031's body mass. Unfortunately for the victim, this horrific process does not kill them. At the same time they are being digested, a flagellum, which is a tentacle-like appendage, will emerge from the sporocarp and wrap around the subject's head. This flagellum has its own set of tiny tendrils that penetrate the cranial cavity and replace the victim's brain's blood vessels, which has the effect of keeping the brain alive and functioning. The head is then removed from the body, and the brain is transported to the central mass of the SCP-031 organism, where it too is incorporated into the creature. It is estimated by Foundation researchers that SCP-031's mass contains thousands of such brains, and by all appearances, they are still alive and conscious. The Foundation first became aware of SCP-031 in 1948, following reports of police activity in North Korea at a location where multiple citizens had gathered near a refugee camp. Those gathered were proclaiming their love for a cult-like leader they referred to as the Beloved. The civilians were able to be calmed through the use of gas-based tranquilizers and amnestics by Mobile Task Force Psi-7, who then recovered a mass that would later be known as SCP-031 and secured it at a local containment site. The SCP-031 creature only weighed 75 kilograms at this time and still had a vaguely human shape. It did not seem to be able to incorporate other matter into its form at this point either, nor could it take on other people's forms with its only anomalous effect seeming to be its ability to inspire intense feelings of love and devotion. The breakout of the Korean War in 1950 led to the destruction of the Foundation containment site, and all anomalies housed there escaped. Following the end of the war in 1953, all of the escaped anomalies were accounted for, all except SCP-031, which was presumed dead. Little more thought was given to the terminated anomaly until 1992, when the SCP Foundation caught wind of reports describing numerous fatalities involving workers at the Ryugyong Hotel. A mobile task force was sent to the hotel to investigate further, but after none of the members returned from the mission, the hotel was locked down and all construction was halted until further notice. By 2008, the increased infestation of the still windowless hotel led to local officials starting construction again to finish the building's exterior and hopefully hide the presence of SCP-031 within, which led to the deaths of even more workers. It's estimated that at its peak infestation, more than 75% of the hotel's 3,000 rooms were infested by SCP-031, but reclamation efforts have been able to reduce that number substantially. Flame projecting equipment is able to destroy SCP-031 tendrils and sporocarps, as well as any personnel who have become assimilated into SCP-031. Reclamation efforts are ongoing, and local officials continue to work with the SCP Foundation to facilitate the ultimate containment or neutralization of the entity. But there's one more strange twist to this story. The more astute SCP experts may have noticed the similarities to SCP-1427, a large slab of beryllium bronze with mind-altering effects that is also located within the Ryugyong Hotel. How is it that two anomalies, both of which strongly impact the human brain, are both somehow housed at the same location? Some clues exist in the form of a classified communication chain between two senior members of Foundation staff. The two discuss the obvious discrepancies that exist when there are records of two anomalies both existing at the same place at the same time, with neither file referencing the other. It leads to a strange paradox where for one to exist, the other isn't able to, and yet they both do exist. 
Teams sent to investigate SCP-1427 will find SCP-1427, and teams sent to investigate SCP-031 will find SCP-031. And yet the first team will have no memory of seeing SCP-031 and vice versa. When the teams were sent at the same time, they were unable to find each other, as if they were existing in parallel dimensions, each with its own version of the Ryugyong Hotel housing its own version of an SCP classified anomaly. Do both anomalies exist? Or perhaps neither of them do? Are both SCPs in fact the result of a third, as yet unknown anomaly? The answer to that question remains unknown, at least to the two senior members of the staff who were communicating about the contradictory files. Both were relieved of their duties under well, suspicious circumstances. And for the time being, both files continue to exist in the database, just as both anomalies seem to exist in the Ryugyong Hotel. For now, this Euclid-class anomaly continues to be contained as well as it can be within the ducts and maintenance shafts of the hotel's central spire. The three secondary spires each contain a Type 9 Heaven's Blade restriction system that focuses a disruptive energy field towards the central spire. This system prevents SCP-031 psychic energies from escaping the structure and affecting any off-site personnel, as North Korean teams continue to push back against the spreading tendrils in the hopes that one day they will finally be able to open the hotel. The explorer slashes his way through the jungle, using his large machete to hack through the thick undergrowth. He suddenly stops and turns around. Which way was it again? His local guide answers, but he must wait for him to finish and his research assistant to translate. He says to continue straight, it's just another hundred yards or so. The gentleman explorer offers a quick nod, before turning to resume cutting his way through the forest. The guide was right though, because after a short way, the dense jungle suddenly opens up, giving way to a clearing that reveals one of the most incredible things the explorer has ever seen. Just ahead of him, rising out of the forest, is a massive ancient stone temple a huge step pyramid of solid stone, intricately carved and covered with elaborate statues. The colossal structure looks like it has been abandoned for centuries if not longer, with nature having done its best to reclaim the stone and cover the pyramid in vines and other plants. The team approaches the temple, but stops in front of a stone monument that stands in front of it. The explorer traces its carved lines with his finger, knocking the dirt away to reveal its weathered pictograph. It appears to depict a sort of creature but with large spread wings instead of arms. Perhaps a kind of ritualistic garb? The explorer says to his assistant. The assistant hastily scribbles in her notebook, trying to document everything she can. Yes, this is definitely a priest-like figure of some kind. Maybe a leader of this temple thanks to the connection he shares to their… The explorer's musings are interrupted by his guide, who he angrily spins around to face. Yes, what? What is it? His research assistant translates for him as usual. He says that we should go no further, that it's too dangerous. Nonsense, replies the explorer. We came all this way, and who knows what fantastic treasures await us inside. Historical treasures, I mean. Artifacts. Treasures of knowledge, of course. Of course, replies his assistant, before following her boss as he starts making his way up the step pyramid, as the guide holds true to his stated intentions and waits near the edge of the jungle. The two of them walk through an entrance that leads into a long, dark hallway. With only torches to light their way, it's impossible to see just how deep it runs into the temple. The explorer stops to examine the walls, which are covered in even more carvings. He can see that there are complicated geometric patterns, but also many more depictions of the same winged creature that was on the monument outside. Here though, the creatures are depicted in moments of action. They appear to be running, chasing, reaching out and grabbing for… people. They are shown attacking them, picking them up carrying them away to… Right where the pictograph story should reveal its climax is a chunk of missing wall. It must have fallen off at some point. Ah, oh well, the explorer declares before moving on to explore more of the temple. His assistant doesn't follow though. She spots several pieces of stone on the floor underneath the missing panel and kneels down to get a closer look. She begins to gather them together, rearranging the various pieces back into their original form. Meanwhile, the explorer's attention has been caught by something else. On the other side of the hall is a statue of a tall, proud warrior, and in his hand he clutches a large bejeweled spear, the gemstones adorning it sparkling in the torchlight. The explorer reaches out and grips the spear's handle. He begins to pull, perhaps being a little rougher than one should with an ancient artifact, but he wants this fabulous jeweled piece, and even more than the spear itself, he wants the acclaim it will bring him back home. As the explorer pulls on the spear, 
His research assistant moves the final piece of the broken wall carving into position. She holds her torch over it to get a better look, and she gasps. The winged creatures are carrying people away, but that isn't the end of the story. They are bringing them somewhere, and she can even see now that they are being presented to an even bigger winged creature. It's a monster. A monster that is feeding on the people. The assistant turns to tell the explorer what she has found, and just as she does, she watches as he is finally able to rend the spear loose from the statue's grip. The statue finally letting go causes him to fall backwards to the ground, where he lies, marveling at the beautiful jeweled spear in his hands. Look out! yells his assistant. The explorer doesn't notice that the statue is precariously rocking back and forth, and he rolls out of the way just before it crashes down right where he was lying and admiring the spear. Are you okay? she asks as she rushes over. I think so, he tells her. Just a little bump on the head. Nothing that can't be fixed up by a good... By a good what? she asks, but he seems distracted by something behind her. By a good... By a good... By God, what is that? He points, and the research assistant turns to see something emerging from a hole in the wall where the statue once stood. It's one of the creatures from the wall carvings. A bizarre half-man, half-lizard, with wings instead of arms. Though there's no flesh at all, the creature is completely made of bone. The two of them both scream at the skeletonized half-human, and the creature screams right back at them, emitting a shrill, high-pitched squeal. Suddenly, more of the creatures begin to emerge from the hole in the wall, with others crawling out of previously unseen and unnoticed holes in the walls and ceiling. The creatures rush towards them, blocking their way out of the temple, and the pair have no choice but to run further down the darkened hallway. As they run, more of the creatures emerge from holes in the darkness, screaming at them and grasping at them with the sharp claws on the end of their wings. As they round a corner, one reaches out and grasps the explorer's ankle, causing him to trip and fall hard onto the stone floor. His assistant rushes to his aid, but as she is helping him up, two more of the creatures appear behind her and envelop her in their bony, winged arms. The explorer stands up and stabs at one of them with a the jeweled spear as they drag her into a dark hole, but a third tears it from his hands. With more still coming down the hallway behind him, the explorer has to run. The hallway in front of him looks to have collapsed at some point in the past, and he has no choice but to enter one of the dark tunnels that has been carved into the rock. The narrow tunnel winds back and forth, and the explorer is unsure of where he is going or what his plan is. He rounds a bend, and the tunnel opens up into a gigantic room. The ceiling must be over a hundred feet high, and he can't see the furthest walls, with the only light emitted by his torch and a dim beam of sunlight coming down through a hole high up in the ceiling. He notices, too, that it has suddenly gone quiet. He turns and looks back at the tunnel he has just emerged from, and notices that the sound of the horrible creatures that were chasing him has ceased. The explorer hears something coming from deeper in the giant room and turns back, peering into the darkness. There, in a single beam of light, he sees one of the winged creatures, but it is moving strangely, as if it isn't walking but floating up into the air, and that's because it isn't walking. As it gets closer, the explorer can see that the winged creature is stuck on the tooth of a giant, monstrous mouth. The huge winged creature emerges from the darkness into the beam of light, tossing back its giant head to consume the creature that was stuck in its teeth, its bones loudly cracking in its mouth. Now, in the light, the explorer can see that the monster, which itself must be hundreds of feet long, is a huge flying lizard of some kind. Or at least it was at one time, since now the majority of its body is made only of bone. What scraps of flesh are left hang off in rotten ribbons. The monster opens its mouth and roars at the explorer. Its foul breath smells like a mausoleum opening up, hitting the explorer in the face. The explorer tries to run, but the monster swipes out with a bony wing that still has a few blackened strips of leathery skin on it and knocks him to the ground. He is pinned to the floor with a huge spiny claw as the creature opens its mouth, roaring again before moving its head down to start feasting on its meal. The explorer closes his eyes, bracing himself to be eaten alive. When the creature suddenly lets out an ear-piercing scream, the explorer opens his eyes to see the jeweled spear sticking out of one of the few spots of flesh remaining on the creature's clawed foot, and gripping the shaft is his assistant. She looks a little worse for wear, but she's alive. She offers him a hand to help him up. They need to get out of there. But first, the explorer pulls the spear from the monster's claw. The two start running, doing everything they can to avoid the monster as it claws and swipes at them. They spot an illuminated opening at the other end of the vast room, and with no other option, start heading towards it. As they get closer, they can see it's just what they needed. Daylight. Escape. They both slide to a stop at the cusp of the opening, nearly tumbling over the edge. 
On the other side, the tunnel opening up out of the side of the temple gives way to nothing but air and a drop of hundreds of feet down to the jungle below. They turn to see the monster still rushing towards them, and without time to think any longer, they both jump, just seconds before the creature snaps its bony jaws in the place where they were standing. It's too big to fit anything more than its mouth out the door, and it howls and screams as they fall through the air before crashing into the ground below. The assistant slowly opens her eyes to see someone. It's their guide. He is cradling her head and asking if she's okay. She sits up, dazed and more than a little bruised from her fall. She asks the guide where the explorer is, if he's all right, and the guide lowers his eyes, looking as though he'd rather not answer. He points next to them without looking, and the assistant turns to see the explorer lying on the ground a few feet away from them, his body impaled on the jeweled spear. History is full of tales and legends about gods, monsters, and everything in between. But not all of these are just stories. And in fact, sometimes the reality is even more terrifying than what we could envision. And that is exactly the case when it comes to SCP-4959, also known as the Teotihuacan Pterodactylactery. SCP-4959 is a huge creature that resembles a pterosaur, which were flying reptiles that existed during the Mesozoic era. While pterosaurs have been extinct for millions of years, SCP-4959 is very much alive, or at the very least, animate. This massive anomaly, whose wingspan stretches approximately 50 meters, is in a living state of decomposition, with roughly 70% of its flesh having rotted or otherwise fallen away, leaving only small patches of skin and decaying tissue clinging to its bones. The flesh that does remain shows no signs of further decomposition though, as if it is permanently locked into this specific stage of advanced decay. Tests of 4959's flesh have shown no apparent abnormalities, save for a slightly higher than expected concentration of iridium. Its eyes are no longer present, but the eye sockets somehow shine with a bright green light, though the source of this luminescence is unknown. When angered, the creature also emits a multicolored corona of fire from its wings, skull, and neck. SCP-4959 was discovered in a gigantic chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent in Teotihuacan, Mexico. A number of tunnels connect to the chamber, and these too are anything but empty. Lurking within the temple's many twisting passages are entities that have been designated SCP-4959-A. These humanoid-sized creatures appear to be constructed of various human and pterosaur bones, creating an all-new creature that is an amalgamation of both. The bones are connected to a central stone-like heart, but it is unknown if this heart was carved from stone, or if it was at one time a real heart that turned to stone through a process of ossification, nor is it fully understood just how the bones are connected to it or stay together. The 4959-A entities also have a number of varying adornments on their bodies which can include strips of decayed fabric, feathers, and precious stones that resemble those worn by the indigenous people who resided in the area many centuries ago. SCP-4959 is carnivorous, though it is unknown if it requires or simply desires to feed. Regardless, it seems to be the task of the SCP-4959-A entities to bring it meals, since the 4959 creature itself is too large to leave its chamber beneath the temple. The hallways and passages that originally connected the temple to the chamber housing SCP-4959 have all collapsed, and the only tunnels now leading to it were most likely dug into the rock and earth by the 4959-A entities. They search through these tunnels, most often working at night, looking for small animals like birds and lizards, but also occasionally finding a larger animal or even a human who has somehow found themselves inside. They will then bring their live prey directly to the giant pterosaur, offering them up as both a meal and a sacrifice. SCP-4959 will then proceed to eat the prey whole, sometimes consuming the 4959-A entity at the same time as well. The temple itself is covered in carvings and murals that give numerous hints as to the origin of SCP-4959. While it is unknown just how it got there, it appears as though the local people discovered the creature within its chamber and regarded it as an avatar of their feathered serpent god, or perhaps another unknown deity. A temple was constructed at the site, and they soon began making sacrifices to the god creature that lived beneath, starting with small animals but then progressing to human sacrifices on important holy days. There is also something else shown in the murals that looks to be of great importance. It seems as though SCP-4959 possessed a sort of heart, which is depicted as a large gemstone, described as being red as blood and bright as the rising sun. This gemstone was previously housed at the pinnacle of the temple, though its current location is unknown. 
Following intense study of the site by SCP Foundation historians, a narrative was pieced together that may explain at least some of what happened there. It seems as though there was an uprising within the local population in roughly the 6th century AD. A conflict had arisen amongst the people as to whether this really was a god or something else, something evil. Those who doubted the deific origins of SCP-4959 wrested control of the temple and journeyed into its depths to attempt to kill the creature. The many scorch marks on the wall are a testament to the battle that likely took place, and while they suffered many losses, it appears as though they were at least able to seal the chamber shut. It is currently unknown what became of the great jewel on top of the temple after this, but its location is of great interest to the Foundation given that it may well be the source of SCP-4959's longevity. SCP-4959 has been classified as Euclid, and it continues to be contained within the chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent, though all of the tunnel entrances leading into it have been blocked by reinforced gates. If new ones are discovered as the result of SCP-4959-A's continued tunneling, they too are to be gated and sealed. Once per week, a large live animal, most often a cow, is deposited down a shaft that leads directly to the chamber, and so far this seems to be keeping SCP-4959 content to stay within its tomb. Just what is SCP-4959? And what are the half-man, half-pterosaur creatures who serve it? Are they former human sacrifices, now destined to live in eternity in servitude to their master? If SCP-4959 was a god at one point, the fact that we are now the ones responsible for feeding it and keeping it happy means that in a sense, we are the ones serving it now. A young man and his girlfriend enter the apartment they share. She tosses her keys on the entryway table as the man checks the time on his phone. He reminds the young woman that they will need to leave soon if they don't want to miss the movie they have purchased tickets for. The woman agrees, but she wants to take a quick shower before they leave. As she goes to freshen up, the man sits down at his computer to get in a quick round or two of his favorite online squad-based first-person shooter. He puts on his headset and jumps into a game. Before he knows it, he's just finished his third round. He checks the time on his phone again and realizes that they were running late. He takes off his headphones and is confused when he hears what sounds like the shower is still running. He gets up and goes to the bathroom door and listens. The shower is definitely still on. The man knocks on the door and asks if everything is alright. He waits a moment but there's no response. He knocks again and still nothing. She doesn't usually take showers this long and he immediately worries that she might have passed out or… well, he doesn't even want to think about it. I'm coming in, okay? He announces as he opens the door to check on her. The man immediately notices how steamy the room is. The hot water must have been running for a while, and he's worried she really did pass out from the heat. What's going on, are you okay? He asks, and when there's no response again, he pulls open the shower curtain to find… nothing. Just an empty tub. There's no sign of his girlfriend anywhere. The man is beyond confused. He turns off the water and goes to the bedroom, but she isn't in there either. He runs to the front door but it's still locked and her keys are sitting on the table. He unlocks the door and sticks his head out into the hallway anyway, but nothing is out there. What is going on? He checks the bedroom again, then the bathroom, but she hasn't suddenly reappeared in either. He's in complete shock, unsure of what could be happening. He sits down on the toilet and puts his head in his hands. His head is spinning as it feels like the world is suddenly falling down all around him. The police are immediately suspicious of the man's story. His girlfriend simply vanished while taking a shower? You expect us to believe that? The detective asks. The man has no answer though. It's as if she simply blinked out of existence. He's convinced she must still be in the building somewhere, that she somehow slipped out without him noticing. But none of the security footage from inside the building shows anything abnormal. There's footage from the cameras in the lobby of them entering the building, but nothing after that of her leaving. Just as in every missing person case like this, the boyfriend is the number one suspect, but without any evidence, they can't hold him any longer. After many long hours of interviews, they finally allow him to leave, but not back to the apartment since it's an active crime scene. The man has no family to speak of, and his few friends seem to have the same suspicions as the police and want nothing to do with him. His girlfriend was the only person he truly had in the world, and now she's gone. He's put up in a shabby motel and days pass, then weeks, then months, but no evidence of the missing woman ever turns up. The man replays the memory of that day over and over in his head, searching for some kind of answer, but try as he might, he can't remember anything helpful, no clue as to what could have happened. The case is completely cold, and has been from the very start. 
the police eventually have to move on to newer, more solvable cases, and they finally allow the man to return home. He's overwhelmed with emotion the first time he enters the apartment. The place is a mess. It looks like the police turned it inside out looking for clues. Not knowing what else to do, he starts the long process of cleaning up the apartment. After hours of putting things away, he eventually gathers the strength to go to the one room he's been avoiding, the bathroom. He opens the door to the last place he's certain his girlfriend was. He enters to find that it looks like the rest of the apartment, as if someone has looked at every single object. But just like him, the police never found any trace of where she went. After straightening up this last room, he decides that he should take a shower and go to bed. It fills him with dread to think about standing in the last place he knows where she was. But he's had months to grieve the loss of his girlfriend, and he's decided that he needs to move on, whatever that means when someone goes missing without a trace. He turns on the shower and lets the water heat up before stepping in. Once he's in, every thought he has is about her. He wonders if she ever actually got in the shower at all, or somehow used it as a diversion to slip out unseen. He just can't figure out how. The day's events race through his mind, just as they have a thousand times before, but his thoughts are interrupted when he notices that the water has started to pool around his feet. He looks down and sees that the drain cover looks normal. Maybe there's a clog, though. Do showers clog when they're not used? He has no idea. He bends down to get a closer look. The long black creature emerges from the drain in the blink of an eye and latches onto his mouth, muffling him before he even has a chance to scream. He struggles and pulls down the curtain on top of him as he falls back onto the shower floor. But it's already too late. And in a matter of minutes, he too will be gone without a trace. Is there anything more comforting after a hard day than a nice, long, hot shower? The answer to that is no, there is nothing better. But that relaxing shower might just be the last you ever take when unbeknownst to you, your pipes are home to an instance of SCP-153, also known as drain worms. SCP-153 refers to a species that resembles the common nematode, or roundworm, consisting of a long, thin body with a large mouth on one end. While some roundworms can grow to as large as a meter long, which is in itself a disturbing thought, SCP-153 instances can be much, much larger and it is estimated that they can reach up to nearly 10 meters in length, though it is hypothesized that some instances in the wild may grow even longer. These worm-like creatures will feed off of any available organic material. However, their favorite form of sustenance is fresh animal tissue, and they appear to have an especially strong predilection towards human flesh. In order to satiate their desire to feed on their preferred prey, SCP-153 has developed a rather unique predatory style that perfectly suits its elongated body structure. While it is unknown just where they originate, they are most often found in the pipes of sewer and drainage systems. 153 instances will swim up those pipes, seeking out ones that lead to people's homes, and especially those that connect to showers and bathtubs. Once they reach the end of the pipe, SCP-153 will latch onto the drain cover and begin secreting an acidic substance. The acid quickly dissolves the drain cover, and SCP-153 will position its own mouth in its place, which it then is able to camouflage as the missing drain cover almost perfectly. Once SCP-153 has taken this position, it is virtually impossible to distinguish it from the original or discern that anything has changed. SCP-153 will then lie in wait until it detects that someone has entered the shower or bathtub. Once the unsuspecting person has begun to bathe, it will very quickly emerge from the drain latching onto the victim's face, most likely in order to prevent them from calling for help. It then begins to rapidly secrete more of the same acid that it used to dissolve the drain cover. With how effectively it was able to dissolve metal, it's no surprise that SCP-153 is able to quickly produce the same effect on its victim. Their skin, muscle, and bone will all be almost immediately liquefied, allowing SCP-153 to feed on the slurry, and the drain worms feed extremely quickly as well. After just several minutes, basically nothing will remain of the person who stepped into the shower, and 153 will retreat back into the drain, leaving no signs that it was ever there, save for the missing drain cover. The SCP Foundation became aware of this anomaly following multiple mysterious missing person cases that all had one key element in common. Each was reported as having disappeared after entering a bathroom to either shower or take a bath. The Foundation soon discovered that large populations of SCP-153 instances were living in the sewers beneath several major American cities, and immediately began enacting containment procedures. The Foundation collected as many specimens as they could, 
and brought them to Bio Research Area 12, where they keep them contained in 10 by 10 by 5 meter tanks that are kept partially filled with sewage and other organic material for them to feed on. Of course, it is of the utmost importance that these containers are never connected to any other plumbing systems, either internal or external. With several specimens contained, the Foundation began researching the creatures in order to hopefully better understand them and how they were able to develop such complex hunting techniques. Research was also approved to find out whether they could be used as a sort of waste disposal system in certain extreme circumstances, such as with SCP-2717, a mass of living animal tissue that has grown to line nearly four kilometers of sewer pipes beneath Amsterdam. A small number of SCP-153 instances were approved for release into the wild in order to test whether they could stall the spread of 2717. However, this experiment was halted following some disturbing new reports. More missing person reports came to the Foundation's attention that bore the hallmarks of an SCP-153 attack. But these new reports were not limited to people who vanished after bathing. It now appears that SCP-153 has further adapted and has begun to emerge not just from showers and bathtub drains, but now also from sinks and yes, even toilets. The Foundation is unaware of just how many instances of SCP-153 continue to exist in the wild there's no doubt that many continue to live and hunt undetected in sewers around the world. This anomaly, which has been classified as Euclid, is taken very seriously by the Foundation, and any reports of people who go missing from bathrooms are immediately investigated for signs of SCP-153. Field agents are to be equipped with infrared and ultraviolet sensors, which can bypass SCP-153's camouflage, and if specimens are able to be captured alive, then they are to be brought to Area 12 for further research. But don't bother worrying too much the next time you step into the tub. If you've been targeted by SCP-153, there's not much you'll be able to do anyway, and your worries will soon be going down the drain, along with whatever remains of you. Tell me if it starts to hurt, the dentist says before reaching into your mouth with a pair of orthodontic pliers and starting to pull your front teeth back into place. Evidently your screams aren't enough of an indication of the extreme pain you feel because he doesn't stop pulling. After what feels like hours of excruciating oral surgery, you're finally standing outside the dentist's office texting with a friend. Come on, show me, it can't be that bad, reads the message from your friend. You're nervous to send her a picture though, since you have a small crush on the girl and you don't want her to see you in this state. But after she asks you again, you decide to take a quick selfie and send it to her anyway. You snap a photo of your mangled mouth and jaw. The mess of wires had to be hastily applied to move your remaining crooked teeth back into place with blobs of fast-hardening epoxy, and the result looks like a low-budget horror movie prosthetic. You send the message and wait. You watch the dots appear that indicate she's writing a response, then watch as they disappear without a reply. You sadly slip the phone back into your pocket and begin walking away. As you make your way home with your head hung in shame, you keep your mouth shut tight. You don't want any passers-by to see what you've become. You decide to detour through the park to avoid any people as much as possible, and as you walk, you decide to stop at a picnic table next to a small pond. You sit at the table and watch the ducks mill about in the water. They have it so lucky, you think. Ducks never have to worry about their teeth getting knocked out by a baseball and leaving them looking like a monster. The ducks suddenly all start moving away from your side of the pond, eventually taking flight and leaving completely. You get the sense that they're trying to get away from something, and you turn around but there's nothing behind you. Oh, it must be me, you think. But then you get the sense that there is something behind you and turn again. Still though, there's nothing. It's just you, the picnic table, and the empty pond. You turn back to watch the still water, but you can't shake the feeling that there's someone behind you and turn again. Hello, is anyone there? You ask, but no one answers. You turn back to the pond and you scream in fright at the thing standing before you and fall back off the picnic table. You get up out of the dirt and you don't wait to stick around to see who or what this thing is. You start to run as fast as you can, but you immediately hear it chasing after you. Instinctually, you take out your phone and start trying to take pictures of whatever it is that's behind you. You know no one will ever believe you and you want some evidence of this, this thing. You manage to snap off a couple of pictures, but you can hear the creature gaining on you. You scream as your mouth begins to ache. Perhaps running this soon after your surgery is causing your damaged teeth to shift and the pain is intense. It starts to feel like your mouth is full of jagged rocks, but you can feel that it is your teeth pushing out and stabbing into your mouth. You take one last picture before the creature leaps on you, sending you both to the ground and your phone tumbling into the dirt. 
Early the next morning, a police perimeter has been set up in the park. The detective arrives and walks past the traumatized-looking jogger who must have been the one that discovered the grisly scene. An officer guarding the site lifts up the police tape so the detective can enter the crime scene that surrounds a body lying under a white sheet. The detective asks the officer if they've found anything yet, and the officer hands the detective a plastic bag containing a dirty cell phone. The detective puts on a latex glove and removes the phone from the bag. The screen is cracked, but it still works. There's numerous messages on the screen that look like they're from someone trying to apologize for not responding sooner, and asking where the phone's owner is and if they're mad at her. The detective opens the phone's camera app and starts looking at the last photos that were taken. It's a strange series of pictures. They seem to all be selfies that a young man was taking as he ran through the park. It almost appears as though there's a figure behind him, but it's hard to tell. There's a foggy white vignette on the pictures that gets worse the further he looks, slowly closing in until the last photo is nothing but a blurred milky white screen. The detective flips the phone over and looks at the lens, which you can see is completely covered in a hard white substance. The detective places the phone back in the evidence bag and kneels down next to the body. The police officer turns away. He's already seen the victim and doesn't need to again. The detective pulls down the sheet to reveal a truly shocking sight. The boy's mouth is a mess of teeth, far, far too many teeth. There are teeth growing out of every part of his gums at horrible angles, filling his mouth and jutting out at painfully odd angles. Who could have done this? What could have done this? The local police department may not have had any idea what the state of this victim meant, but the SCP Foundation did, because they had seen the same occurrence dozens of times before. In fact, they had seen it happen so many times that they had classified this anomalous entity as SCP-4910, but it had already earned a much more ominous nickname within the Foundation. It was known as The Grinner. Very little is known about SCP-4910 and eyewitness accounts of the creature are all extremely brief due to those who have interacted with it quickly succumbing to its effects. What is known is that SCP-4910 is a quadruped and appears to be made partially, or perhaps entirely, out of teeth. Those who encounter SCP-4910 quickly experience its primary anomalous effect, which is that it causes the extremely rapid overproduction of teeth in its victims' mouths. Existing teeth will quickly increase in size, protruding farther out of the gums than should be able, while new teeth will begin to sprout from any available space in the mouth, including the roof of the mouth and underneath the tongue. These new teeth will completely fill the mouth, which almost immediately inhibits their ability to speak or vocalize at all. The creature will then use this opportunity to attack and incapacitate the victim before starting to feed. Further adding to the mystery of SCP-4910's appearance, comes from the effect it has on any nearby recording equipment. Cameras and other devices that come within SCP-4910's proximity will have their critical components compromised by a sudden appearance of a layer of dentin, which is the calcified material that partially makes up teeth. Interestingly, SCP-4910 seems to possess some level of intelligence, as it appears able to differentiate between normal civilians, who it hunts for sustenance, and members of organizations that seek to hunt down and contain or harm it, which it uses for an even more nefarious purpose. While the exact mechanics are still unclear, it seems as though SCP-4910 is able to infect certain anomalous organization members with its ability, causing them to act as a vector for the effect who then spread it to even more victims. This effect is, of course, of great concern to the Foundation, and containment protocols for infected victims have been hastily put into place. Should a member of staff begin bearing a grin with too many teeth or multiple tooth-filled smiles, they are to be immediately immobilized by any means necessary, though preferably with a firearm that allows one to keep an appropriate distance and hopefully prevent any further spread of the effect. The infected individual is then to be doused in a hydrochloric chemical compound that will reduce the afflicted to a pulp-like substance. Once this pulp is no longer animate, it can be transferred to the closest incineration site for disposal. Should a member of personnel have an interaction with SCP-4910 and feel that they were exposed to its anomalous effects, they may be saved by taking immediate medical action. Oral surgery to remove the additional teeth has been found to be effective when the procedure is undergone in the first one to two hours following exposure, though the victim will suffer lifelong permanent physical issues from the procedure. Once three hours have passed, the effect will have spread to the rest of the body, with teeth appearing virtually anywhere. Unfortunately for the victim, should the infection reach this point, pain management has been shown to be ineffective, 
and there is nothing that can be done to alleviate their suffering, save for termination. SCP-4910 remains at large and has been given the Keter classification. Mobile Task Force Epsilon, codenamed Turfing Black, is the only MTF authorized to respond to sightings, and they have been given permission to engage the creature and utilize lethal force if necessary, due to the danger this anomaly presents specifically to the SCP Foundation. The boy screams as his body transforms. His bones warp and twist as feathers emerge from his pores, and his skull sharpens into a long, hard beak. He's in a living nightmare. And who could have guessed it all started with an innocent attempt to play hooky? It's an ordinary Monday morning, and all over town, children are waking up and reluctantly dragging themselves out of bed for school. Some are oversleeping, hitting the snooze on their alarms, and getting a bit of extra shut-eye before their exhausted parents notice, wake them up, and rush to get them to school before the first morning bell. In one particular bedroom, a young boy is awake but still in bed, brainstorming as fast as he can. He is determined to skip school today however he can. He usually doesn't mind school very much, but today, all he can think about is the math test he didn't study for, and the mean classmate who likes to knock his books out of his hands. But he can't just ask to skip school for no reason. He has to come up with a plan. He runs to the bathroom, splashing hot water in his face to give him a flushed appearance and a warm forehead. Then he hops back into bed and begins to loudly cough and sniffle until his mother comes to check on him. He complains that he doesn't feel well enough to go to school, and sure enough, when his mother feels his forehead, it is hot to the touch. She agrees to let him stay home from school for the day, provided he stays in bed and gets plenty of rest. He promises that he will, and she leaves to go to work. On her way to work, the boy's mother remembers that there isn't much for him to eat while he's home alone all day. At least, there isn't much that he would want to eat while he's sick. She decides that she can be a little bit late to work for the sake of her son's health, and pulls into a nearby grocery store. She rushes out of her car and into the store, making a beeline for the soup aisle. She reaches for her usual go-to brand of chicken noodle soup, but finds the shelf completely bare. That's right, it's flu season. Of course, the soup is sold out. Oh great, this is exactly what she needs. A sick kid at home, one can of chicken noodle soup left at the store, and the machine won't even scan it. She smacks the side of the machine in frustration, and the screen reads, invalid code, transaction cancelled. With a heavy sigh, she glances over her shoulder. No one is watching. She tried to pay for the can to do the right thing, but the machine wouldn't let her. So she grabs the can and runs out of the store before anyone can spot her. While his mother is out, the boy is at home raiding the pantry for snacks to sate his not at all sick appetite. He fills up on Oreos and toaster pastries, cheesy crackers and chips. When he hears his mother's car pulling into the driveway, he quickly wipes the crumbs from his face and jumps back into bed, just in time for his mother to find him there, resting like he promised he would. She gives him a kiss on the forehead and tells him that she'll heat up some chicken noodle soup for him to eat. She's in a hurry to make it to work though, so she'll need to leave it in the microwave for him. She pours the contents of the soup into a bowl, adds a bit of water, and pops the bowl into the microwave for a few minutes. She calls up to her son, letting him know that the soup will be ready when the microwave dings. Then she rushes out the door and heads to work for the day, confident that her son will be fine through her shift. If he happens to need anything, he can call her and let her know. The boy hears the microwave ding, but his stomach is too full from his rummage through the pantry for him to want any of the soup, in spite of its heavenly aroma. Instead, he creeps into the living room and sits down to play video games until his eyes start to hurt. As he boots up his gaming system, he thinks for a moment that he can hear a strange noise coming from the kitchen, a soft, clucking sound, like the chickens he saw on his grandparents' farm. But he quickly forgets about the sound as the screen lights up, and he disappears into the world of his favorite game. He plays for hours, until the grumbling of his stomach interrupts his concentration. He's suddenly very hungry, and remembers the soup his mother left in the microwave. It is certainly cold and unappealing by now, but he can just reheat it first. He punches the buttons on the microwave and waits for the soup to be ready. Again, he can hear strange noises coming from the microwave, but he doesn't think anything of it. The microwave dings, and he pulls out the bowl of soup, grabs a spoon, and digs in. A little while later, the boy's mother pulls into the driveway in a panic. She left work early when her phone rang with a call from her son. She answered, asking what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer her. All she could hear on the other end was rustling, heavy breathing, and some pain grunting. Fearing the worst, she drove back as fast as she could, running several red lights along the way. Now she fumbles with her keys as she unlocks the door, terrified of what she will find. 
She grips her phone in her other hand, thumb hovering over the buttons, ready to dial 911 if the situation calls for it. She pushes the front door open, calling her son's name. He doesn't answer, and her stomach drops. Suddenly, she hears the loud thud of something heavy being knocked to the ground. Something is terribly wrong here, and even though she might find her worst nightmare, she has to face whatever is waiting for her inside. She runs into the kitchen and finds it a mess. The bowl of soup is shattered on the floor, congealed, cold soup pooling on the tile. The kitchen table is turned over on its side. The kitchen chairs are in disarray. But the strangest sight is the dozens of tiny, white, fluffy things on the floor, counters, and furniture. She picks one up for a closer look and finds herself even more confused than before. It's a feather. They're all feathers. She calls her son's name again, praying for a response. This time, she receives one, though not the one she hopes for. She hears the sound of shuffling footsteps up above, followed by a strangled sound like a scream caught in someone's throat. She sprints up the stairs as fast as her legs can carry her, throwing open the door to her son's bedroom. There, she finds him. But this is not the bright-eyed boy that she left behind when she left for work. His arms are covered with a thick layer of white feathers, the same feathers that are beginning to poke through the skin of his face. The top of his head has elongated into a floppy comb of excess skin, the same sort of excess skin that is wobbling below his chin. And his mouth, it doesn't look like a mouth anymore. It's pointed and hard, and his lips click together when he speaks, or rather, clucks. His bare feet are scaly and red, with claws protruding from his toes. He flaps his wings frantically, eyes wide and wild, clucking and running back and forth across the room. When he looks at her, she does not see recognition in his gaze. Her son, her beloved boy, has turned into a chicken. Unable to do anything else, the mother calls an ambulance. At first, the paramedics that arrive on the scene think the call was some sort of elaborate prank, but when they set eyes on the boy, they agree that something truly bizarre is going on. They speed to the hospital with the chicken boy in tow, but sadly are unable to save his life. The mother turns over the can of the mysterious soup to the authorities, who launch a formal investigation. Unfortunately, they are unable to trace the can to any store, nor are they able to verify the existence of the company name on its label. Employees of the grocery store where she found the can insist that they have never seen it in their lives. Several weeks after this incident occurred, the SCP Foundation conducted a raid on a New York office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. For those of you unfamiliar with the organization, and that is most of the general population by design, Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD is an extremely powerful multinational corporation founded by three individuals with those surnames, specializing in the acquisition and sale of anomalous items, entities, and experiences. To put it simply, they run the largest anomalous black market in the world and are the crime bosses of the paranormal world. During this particular raid, SCP Foundation operatives recovered 17 different unusual items. Among the items discovered was a shipping crate recently delivered by the Federal Postal Service from an invalid return address. This crate contained 103 cans of SCP-2057, as well as a copy of a letter written to one of the company's associates. So far, the letter has not been traced to an address. It reads, Dear Cyrus, Maria has told me of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen your children. I had hoped to hear about the improvement of their condition soon. As their godfather, I am extremely distressed to hear this. Having experienced a child suffering from the measles myself, I know how terrifying it can be when it seems as if they are getting worse. Recently, we received a shipment of something that I hope can help your family. There is a crate in the storage area marked with Wondertainment Discontinued Item. It will not be there long, as it goes to auction next week. I will leave a key under the photo of your family on your desk. Follow the instructions exactly. Do not, under any circumstances, do anything different than what is directed on the can. Destroy this message as soon as possible. I do not want any of this to come back on us. Be careful, my friend. Williams. SCP-2057 consists of 92 318 milliliter cans of condensed chicken noodle soup. Each can is covered with a brightly colored label depicting images of noodles, a cartoon chicken, and dancing vegetables. In addition to this inviting imagery, each label is emblazoned with the text, Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Each can has a pull-top lid for easy opening, and is printed with a set of nutrition facts, ingredients, and instructions for heating. 
The nutrition facts are as follows. Calories, 95. Fat, 3.17 grams. Carbohydrates, 2.2 grams. Protein, 13.48 grams. Vitamin W, 2 grams. And mother's love, 10 grams. The SCP Foundation attempted to analyze the contents of the soup in order to compare it to the posted nutrition facts. The calories, fat, carbohydrates, and protein were found to be accurately reported. Vitamin W was present in the reported amount as well, though it was not a compound that the Foundation scientists had ever encountered before. Mother's love, as it is an intangible concept, was not able to be identified or measured in the analyzed soup samples. The ingredients are listed as ultralicious chicken stock, enriched Chinese egg noodles, finest cooked chicken breast, farm fresh carrots, crispy crunchy celery, sweet Vidalia onions, no paint thinner, fresh mountain spring water, vitamin W. Contains less than 2% of the following ingredients. A pinch of salt, a smidgen of chicken fat, sprinkle of spice extracted from rare plants, a dash of high quality unicorn tears. The instructions for heating read, Hey kids, feeling sick, icky, or downright yucky? Just pop open a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Place contents of the can in a medium-sized soup pot. Add a can of water, stir, and heat. Watch as the fun begins. Eat hearty, and you'll feel better and ready to play with Dr. Wondertainment toys in no time. All of this is relatively straightforward, give or take a few unusual ingredients. Someone taking only a quick look might mistake a can of this soup for any other chicken noodle soup. However, it does have something that most ordinary canned soup does not, a warning label. Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids is intended to be eaten while it is hot to make you feel better in no time at all. Do not consume after it has become cold. Do not reheat. By purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment, you agree to not hold Dr. Wondertainment or any of Dr. Wondertainment's affiliates accountable for injuries or damages incurred by your product. Thank you for purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment. So what exactly is in a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids? Well, when the SCP Foundation first opened a can to take a look, they found that it was filled with condensed chicken broth and a mass of egg noodles shaped like an egg. When water was added and the contents of the can were heated to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, the noodle-based egg hatched. Inside was a small domesticated chicken made up of egg noodles, carrot, celery, onion, and cooked chicken breast. For simplicity's sake, this chicken noodle soup chicken is referred to as SCP-2057-1. As the Foundation researchers continued to heat the broth to a higher temperature, SCP-2057-1 began to move around, make audible chirping sounds, and eat the broth. As it ate, it grew larger and larger until it reached a mass of 85 grams and resembled a miniature adult chicken. At a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, SCP-2057-1 behaved much like an ordinary chicken. It continued to behave normally even as it was consumed or cut apart, apparently feeling no pain or awareness of its situation. Dissection of SCP-2057-1 revealed that its insides were made up of soup ingredients, including celery and onion bones, cooked chicken breast muscles, carrot beak and legs, and chicken broth blood. When SCP-2057-1's temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius, it stopped moving and collapsed into the soup. At a temperature below 20 degrees Celsius, it became congealed and unappetizing. With these observations completed, the Foundation then attempted to measure the effects of this unusual chicken soup on a person that ingested it. When test subjects were fed samples of the soup at a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, they had a very positive experience. The soup's taste was described as excellent, delicious, and homey. Though the meal caused a bit of psychological distress due to the soup chicken's realistic appearance and behavior, it improved every test subject's physical well-being. This eventually applied to test subjects with a case of influenza, measles, or the common cold. Following consumption of SCP-2057, each subject with a diagnosed illness of this kind reported immediate relief from their symptoms, including fever, aches and pains, cough, and congestion. With this positive, if a bit disturbing, effect documented, the Foundation next set out to determine what would happen if they let the soup get cold before it was eaten. Test subjects served this version of the soup had a far worse experience, describing the taste of their meal as bland, disgusting, and repulsive. 67% of the test subjects experienced cramps, chills, and diarrhea following their consumption of the soup, 
and 62% found themselves making involuntary clucking noises, as well as experiencing a strong aversion to poultry products. Again, several test subjects were deliberately selected based on their cases of influenza, measles, and the common cold. These test subjects immediately began to develop troubling symptoms, including the growth of pin feathers on their forearms, loosened excess skin on their heads and under their chins, a change in their ability to walk normally, and distressing hallucinations of being hung upside down by the ankles. Following these two rounds of testing, the research team decided to see why exactly the warning label advised against reheating the soup. D-Class 45782 was selected as the test subject for this particular experiment and was instructed to reheat a bowl of cooled SCP-2057-1 in a microwave on high for 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Then, he was to consume the reheated soup and report his experience to a camera placed in the room with him. As instructed, D-45782 microwaved the bowl of soup. As it heated in the microwave, it emitted unintelligible vocalizations in a deep voice. After removing the bowl from the microwave, D-45782 noted that it was gelatinous looking with blackened burnt bits around the edges. He took three bites of the disgusting, hot and cold at the same time mixture before spitting it out onto the floor and refusing to eat another bite. Fifteen minutes after tasting the reheated soup, D-45872 began to exhibit significant distress, plucking angrily into the camera. Five minutes later, D-45872 became more difficult to understand clucks and other chicken-like vocalizations, making up most of his attempted speech. He began scratching vigorously at his arms to the point of drawing blood. Loose skin could be seen gathering on the top of his head and under his neck. Six minutes later, D-45872 had lost the ability to speak. Large white pin feathers had sprouted from his arms, covering the skin, and smaller white feathers were beginning to sprout from his face. After 16 more minutes passed, D-45872 began attacking other objects in the room, attempting to destroy the microwave, knocking the bowl of soup to the floor, and flipping over a table and chair. He had grown feathers over 67% of his skin, and his face had begun to change drastically. His nasal area was elongated and hardened, joining with his lower jaw in an appendage resembling a bird's beak. His upper lip had disappeared into his nasal cavity. Only five minutes later, D-45872 suddenly stopped moving and collapsed to the floor, dead. Following D-45872's death, an autopsy was performed. These were the findings. Autopsy revealed D-45782's cause of death was due to extreme and sudden physical change of internal organs, resulting in shock and cardiac arrest. 93% of the subject's skin was covered in feathers. Physical changes in the face resulted in a beak-like alteration of the nose and mouth, Loose skin under the neck and on the top of the head resemble a waddle and comb. Subjects' lower legs were found to be covered in thick, scaly skin, with the toes of the subject's feet ending in small, rounded claws. The subject and instance of SCP-2057-1 were incinerated after testing and autopsy. Whenever not being used for approved experimentation, all cans of SCP-2057 must be stored in a standard, large-volume storage locker in Containment Area 27 and kept at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Because SCP-2057 is in limited supply, all experiments must first be approved by at least two personnel with 2-1103 clearance, as well as receiving the go-ahead from Dr. Applegate. There are still 41 cans of Dr. Wondertainment's chicken soup unaccounted for, and the Foundation has been unable to track them down so far. Who knows where they ended up? Maybe at another office of Marshall Carter and Dark. Or maybe, just maybe, one made its way onto the shelves at your local grocery store. Best to be careful out there. When you're feeling sick, hungry, or in need of a little pick-me-up, there's nothing quite like a steaming hot bowl of chicken noodle soup. Just make sure to read the label carefully and always follow the printed instructions. If you ignore them, you might just find that your chickens have come home to roost. After all, as the saying goes, you are what you eat. The store manager had heard of crazy customers, but this was something else. A mob comes barreling towards the store, visible through the display windows as they charge down the street. They all look crazed, much closer in appearance to rabid animals than human beings, frenzying, foaming at the mouth. A few of them stumble in their haste while rushing for the automatic sliding doors. Some fall to the ground, only for others to clamber over them, leaping like athletes going over hurdles, with all the same speed, but with none of the grace. To the staff inside the store, 
They looked like a pack of zombies, all apparently infected by the same virus that had given them such a ravenous hunger. For savings. I thought Black Friday was a week ago, the trainee remarks as the doors slide open and the first of the mob spills inside. Welcome to the Mattress Madness Megastore, everyone. If you could kindly form an orderly... Within seconds, the trainee vanishes as a tidal wave of Madden Mattress Store customers starts to pile into the store. Each and every one of them is deranged. That much is clear, even from a distance. Across the store, the store manager watches as his colleagues are shoved and tackled out of the way, just from their misfortune of standing too close to the entrance. It's only as one of the mob wanders closer that the store manager notices their eyes. Both lids stay shut, somehow closed, despite the crazed customer standing upright. They aren't screwed tightly. It's clear this person isn't forcefully keeping their eyelids clamped down. Instead, they're gently sealed as if the customer is still asleep or sleepwalking. The whole situation was astounding. First thing in the morning, just at opening time, a horde of sleepwalking customers barged their way into the Mattress Madness megastore, moving and fighting retail staff as if they were all still awake and fully aware. And as if that isn't bizarre enough, it quickly turns out these people aren't here because they're eager not to miss out on great deals on their bedroom furniture. To the store manager's horror, the mob has come to the Mattress Madness megastore for breakfast. He watches an elderly woman, eyes closed, shuffle up to a luxury cashmere pillow top California king-size mattress and proceed to eat it. And not bite by bite either, not even ripping off pieces to chomp through like so much cotton candy. In a far more horrifying fashion, the old lady eats the mattress whole. The store manager feels his blood run cold at the sight of her mouth widening unnaturally, unhinging like a snake eating its prey. Except in this bizarre, unaired nature documentary, the snake is a human being, and its meal is a perfectly good bed that moments before had been resting on a stylish ottoman frame. The same exact display of confusing carnage is unfolding all over the Mattress Madness megastore, people devouring entire Egyptian cotton mattresses. Some had even already devoured their respective meals and were already moving on to any accompanying pillows or cushions, feeding on them in much the same way. The few members of staff bold enough to try and intervene couldn't seem to wake the sleepwalking shoppers up. No matter how hard they gripped each one by the shoulders and shake, nothing could deter them from devouring divans and munching on memory foam. A sudden, terrifying, and inescapable thought cuts through all the confusion, striking the store manager with an even greater fear. The stock room. Behind a series of doors marked with signs reading, employees only, are shelves upon shelves of new units. The Mattress Madness Megastore being a much bigger outlet means that there's additional inventory to replace any mattresses on the shop floor that gets sold. And more mattresses mean more food for the mob. The worry that these sleepwalkers might soon develop a taste for human flesh never occurs to the store manager. He hurriedly races around the store, gathering up as many of his surviving staff as he can, and urges them to help him defend the stock in the back room. Some are already abandoning their posts, ripping name tags off their polo shirt uniforms and rushing to leave the store. They aren't willing to die for $7.25 an hour. The Mattress Madness Megastore has insurance. It'll cover the damaged stock once the crazed customers have feasted on feather beds, but the manager urges them to stay. The store's insurance covers stock that is damaged in transit, not mattresses that are eaten by hungry lunatics. A few stay, using the manager's desperation to leverage pay raises and more annual vacation days in exchange for their help during this crisis of cashmere carnivory. With his resistance force gathered, the store manager commands the remaining employees to charge for the door at the back of the store, but some of the nearby mattress eaters overhear in their sleepwalking state. The staff freeze, uncertain whether to bolt for the stockroom and risk being chased by the hungry customers. They need a distraction, a sacrificial lamb to grab the horde's attention. And with a solemn expression, the store manager realizes what he must do. This isn't a fight he'll make it out of alive. He leaps up onto a twin inner spring and calls out to the crazed customers. Attention, everyone, he bellows. I'd like to announce that all our mattresses are half off for the next five minutes. The crowd goes even more rabid, all eager to eat the pillowy pedestal the store manager is standing upon. His staff flees in the opposite direction, rushing to barricade themselves inside the storeroom while their boss meets a grisly demise, and the crazed customers devour every remaining mattress in sight. But what on earth could have possibly caused such a scene to unfold? 
What was the inciting incident for this unprecedented act of mass matricide, the Devon destruction, and combination carnage? All it took was one seemingly innocuous image, an unassuming online post, to stir over 7,000 people into a featherbed feeding frenzy. It's December the 3rd, 2020, almost an entire day before the deranged events that would soon unfold at the Mattress Madness Megastore. And just like he does most days after college, the student is trawling various internet forums in search of things to laugh at. He's procrastinating and, through inaction, allowing himself to be buried under a veritable avalanche of assignments, all with rapidly approaching dates that they're due in by. But he doesn't care. He can always do them tomorrow. As far as he's concerned, there's plenty of time for him to waste doing, well, very little. But no matter where he looks, nothing brings with it even the smallest hit of dopamine. It's been hours since he stopped checking the clock at the bottom right-hand corner of his computer screen, instead wearing out the muscles of his finger as it spins the scrolling wheel of his mouse. His social media feed is all the same, more doom and gloom, and despite his searching, he can't find anything funny to alleviate his ongoing existential nightmare for so much as a second. If anything, seeing every anxiety-inducing post about the state of the world, or dour headlines of reposted news articles, only makes everything worse. That is, until the fateful link appears in his inbox. It's from one of his friends at college, living in the dorm across campus. The pair of them constantly swapped links and exchanged memes over direct messages, sometimes while sitting in the middle of important lectures. So the student quickly opens up the latest message from his friend, pleased to have something to relieve the monotony instilled by the prior several hours worth of mindless scrolling. Sure enough, his friend's message sits waiting to be read in his inbox. It's just a single blue hyperlink, with no additional context offered, nothing to indicate what the link is or what website it leads to, or even why the student's friend bothered to send it. They're long past the need to provide context for the memes they send each other. The link redirects to a familiar corner of the internet to the student, the deep fried meme subreddit. Just seeing that written in the hyperlink is enough to spur an enthusiastic click. It's like going home, back to somewhere warm and welcoming, where everybody knows your name, and they're always glad you came, and where the student knows he's bound to find something to entertain himself. A deep-fried meme is usually a heavily edited image with a number of different filters added to it. Its contrast is boosted, the picture is oversaturated and distorted, all to the point wherein the colors are unnatural, and the image appears as a grainy, washed-out mess of pixels. And they're one of the student's favorite subgenre of funny posts. Opening up the link sent by his friend, he finds one such deep-fried meme staring back at him. It depicts a man, long-haired and wearing dark clothes, presumably a fan of heavy metal music. In front of the metalhead is a table, with a chessboard placed neatly atop it. The pieces on the board are distributed in such a way that places the metalhead in checkmate, and his opponent? Directly opposite him at the table is a glass bowl filled with water and a goldfish aimlessly swimming around. And to top off this Louvre-worthy masterpiece is text, seemingly cut and paste from various different places, judging by the alternating fonts and styles. The words have been placed into a sentence that reads, Tell me your secrets, fish. And the student explodes with laughter, as if answering his prayers for some humorous entertainment to avoid working on his college assignments, his friend had appeared out of the blue and delivered a perfect deep-fried meme. But that momentary boost in serotonin levels quickly subsides, and the student knows how these exchanges work. This has to be reciprocal, a mutual trading of memes, like for like, akin to swapping trading cards in the playground at a younger age. And so he searches the subreddit for a token worthy of returning to his friend. He clicks on a search filter, sorting the results from the top posts of all time to the most recent posts of the day. These were fresh, hot off the presses, or out of the deep fryer in this case. And the newer they were, the lower the chances that his friend had already seen them. Scrolling through, the student is met with a few underwhelming attempts that weren't worthy of the prestige expected by the deep fried meme subreddit. They'd be better suited for posting on R cringe. But then, it appears, the perfect, deep fried, crispy, golden brown, cooked to perfection picture to send back to his friend. The distorted image is a photograph of a bed, specifically a king size mattress on what looks like a polished wooden bed frame although it's not easy to tell thanks to just how grainy the picture has been made. Whoever edited this meme knew what they were doing and has nailed the absurdist, bizarre humor that the student and his friend thrive on. A label over the mattress simply reads, King Size, 
and the meme is captioned in a classic top text, bottom text format with the phrase, a feast fit for a king. And the piece de resistance, the crowning touch that makes this meme worthy of the student's lofty standards, is the title given to it by the original poster. It sums up the meme perfectly, succinctly in three words, eat your mattress. The student erupts into uncontrollable fits of laughter, so much so that tears start to stream down his face. His stomach almost feels like it might explode at just how fine he thinks the post he's found is. Through giggles that hit like the aftershock of an earthquake, he copies the link to the Eat Your Mattress meme into a message and hits send to share the hilarity with his friend. Little does he know, he's just condemned his friend to the same fate that now awaits him. As soon as he falls asleep, it'll happen. And the student and his friend aren't the only ones either. The post spreads, either sent directly from one person to another or seen by those just browsing the deep fried meme subreddit and happening across the Eat Your Mattress photo. Not all of them find it funny. They don't have to. They aren't even required to share it, to pass it on to someone else and help the post spread like wildfire. They've looked at it and that's enough. Come the next day, an estimated 7,000 people across the world have seen the same meme and it affects them all in the exact same way, becoming a directive, a command planted in their subconscious, one that they will act on without even realizing. It's been only a few hours since all the carnage erupted at the Mattress Madness Megastore, but by now, the SCP Foundation has swept in and taken control of the scene. A cordoned section of multiple blocks, under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak, it's enough to keep civilians and prying eyes away without asking too many questions, but as for the Foundation personnel themselves, they've got plenty of unanswered questions of their own. Two members of the cleanup team are reviewing the store's security footage, baffled by the sights of the chaos that unfolded there earlier that same morning. On the screen, frenzied customers are eating entire mattresses, stretching their mouths wide open and swallowing them whole. They watch as the store manager appears to make an attempt at a noble sacrifice to distract the horde of ravenous customers so his employees can rush towards the storeroom. But the manager is fine. Once the horde has eaten all the mattresses out on the store's main floor, they start trying to break into the stockroom out back where the other employees have used layers upon layers of cellophane-wrapped mattresses to barricade the door. By the time the foundation arrives, the customers have already forced their way into the stockroom and have devoured around half of the mattresses while exhausted employees try to wake them from their sleepwalking state. The foundation sees to it that everyone affected is rapidly administered with memory-wiping amnestics to forget all about the ordeal. Their next job is to try and track down the source of whatever caused this unprecedented outbreak of mattress eating. But being experts in all things anomalous, it doesn't take the Foundation long to start pursuing possible explanations. Having already confirmed this wasn't a viral anomaly, their next course of action is to investigate possible mimetic causes, and sure enough, a common factor quickly presents itself. The mob that attacked the Mattress Madness Megastore, along with subjects who have engaged in similar acts of mattress eating across the world, all have one thing in common. Each one has been exposed to the Eat Your Mattress post on the Deep Fried Meme subreddit. It takes some deduction on the Foundation's part to figure out the cause, after all, the meme in question is similar to a number of others posted in the same subreddit. As a result, the Foundation's online detection software, or web crawlers, initially fail to flag the mattress meme as an anomalous image. Once they do, it is designated as SCP-5126. But with a cause established, the pieces start to fit together. The Foundation's researchers soon realize what the image does. Another reason it was initially missed is that its effects only occur once the subject that has seen it falls asleep. The student is one such subject who lived through this. He dozes off in his gaming chair well past the middle of the night hours after he's first seen SCP-5126. While sound asleep, without waking up once, he starts to seek out his mattress, laying unoccupied on his bed on the other side of his cramped dorm room. He and all the others who have seen SCP-5126 then consume their mattresses, including in many cases their pillows, any cushions, and even plush toys. Their bodies stretch unnaturally to accommodate the meal, only to return to normal once they have done the deed. Having returned to normal, the student and the others like him remain unaware they've just eaten a mattress. But the Foundation is left puzzled. There's still one question that hasn't been answered. Their examination of the several hundred customers at the Mattress Madness Megastore revealed that the consumed mattresses aren't digested like food ordinarily is. They vanish without a trace. So this naturally begs the question, 
Where are all these Eaton mattresses going? Well, the Foundation quickly comes up with an experiment to find out. They place tracking devices inside of the cell of a member of D-Class personnel and expose him to SCP-5126. Sure enough, the meme takes effect, and once asleep, he eats his mattress. The experiment is going exactly as the Foundation planned. Now they can follow the signal from the tracking devices to pinpoint the destination that all the consumed mattresses are disappearing to. And after several sweeps of the Earth's surface, their satellites discover a ping coming from a remote location in the state of Montana. MTF Sigma-16 suit up, ready to head out to the location. This mobile task force operates under the code name Slumber Party, and it's up to them to investigate. They come across a large structure. It looks a lot like a medieval castle, but it has been built out of mattresses and large cushions. It's the ultimate pillow fort. It even has pillars and all the fortifications you'd expect from a real historical castle all made out of even more pillows. The slumber party team enters the fort and quickly discovers that the structure is able to anomalously reconstruct itself. Sigma-3 kicks over a stack of pillows and plush toys arranged to resemble a statue and watches as it reforms after collapsing. The team ventures deeper into the pillow fort and is quickly met with humanoid entities that are also made out of pillows. An entity swipes a pillow arm at Sigma-1, but she ducks out of the path of the attack Drawing her firearm, she fires, causing a plume of feathers to spray out of the pillow person. The entity is unfazed, and several additional shots do nothing. Even a taser is ineffective. The pillow entities are exhibiting extreme resistance to damage, but Sigma-2 has an idea. She grabs a pillow from one of the walls and uses it to bash the entity attacking her teammate Sigma-1. The pillow person collapses into a pile on the floor, inanimate, and just like that, the mobile task force has a way to fight back. They all grab pillows and make quick work of their attackers before they move on to explore the rest of the castle. Then they encounter the king. There is a man sitting atop a large stack of cushions, wearing a nightcap and pajamas, eating feathers from an expensive brand of pillow. Scattered around him are empty pillowcases. Trying to ignore the smell, the slumber party team attempts to interrogate him. He claims to be the king of cushion, obsessed with pillows since a young age. Their smell, taste, and texture inspire him to create a kingdom of plush, his masterpiece of mattresses. It doesn't take very long for the Foundation operatives to realize that this man is insane. They question him about how SCP-5126, the Eat Your Mattress meme, works. How is it able to make people consume entire mattresses and send them to the king's cushiony castle? And why? Well, the king explains that buying mattresses is expensive, so in order to build his castle, he's outsourced the gathering of building materials. As he sees it, he is offering people affected by the meme a delicious meal in exchange for their beds, spreading the world of pillows so he can gather resources for his kingdom. Suddenly, he challenges the slumber party team to a pillow fight for having tracked him down. The king of cushion takes up a pillow in one hand and charges towards the mobile task force, armed and ready to do battle with them all. He is quickly incapacitated by Sigma-1's taser and drops to the floor defeated. Now designated SCP-5126-A, the King of Cushion is transported back to the SCP Foundation for analysis and containment. Their testing reveals he possesses no anomalous properties whatsoever, and the King actually requires his stomach to be pumped thanks to the copious amounts of pillow feathers he's been eating. The Foundation gets to work dismantling his pillow fort and moving all the components into storage. And as for the Eat Your Mattress meme itself, the Foundation's web crawlers are keeping an eye out for any other posts of the anomalous image. And don't worry, if you find yourself giggling at a funny deep-fried image that jokingly implies you should eat your mattress, the Foundation will ensure you don't remember it happening. And they'll even throw in a replacement for your swallowed mattress at no added cost. Now that's a bargain. The researchers and guards scream in terror as the creatures run rampant through the factory. Nobody ever imagined they could be so dangerous, and all for a little live entertainment. The janitor rolls his mop cart down the hall of his brand new workplace. It's his first day on the job, and you would never let anyone hear him admit it, but he's a little bit nervous. The building is a huge, fancy research facility, an intimidating, sprawling building, bustling with researchers in lab coats, executives in suits, and dozens of security guards. The previous place he'd worked had cubicles and a break room with a 20-year-old coffee machine, and this place 
had state-of-the-art technology and keycard locks on every door. Still, he was here to do a job, and that's what he was going to do. Though he was getting distracted by the intensity of the place when there are spills to clean, and apparently, there's a big one. As soon as the janitor had clocked in, a researcher had rushed over to tell him that he was desperately needed on one of the lower levels. So here he was, rolling his cart toward the elevator, holding the researcher's keycard in his hand. His own won't work to take him down to the appropriate level. His security clearance isn't high enough. He wonders, idly, why this company has such tight security, but figures that it isn't his job to ask that sort of question. Instead, he enters the elevator, swipes the card, and hits the button for LG-1. The elevator doors open with a ding, and the janitor wheels his cart out. Right away, he notices something off about this level. There are rows of massive glass boxes, filled with what look like giant fuzzy puppets. He can hear the usual sounds of chatter and footsteps, but there's also the clucking of chickens, the bleat of a goat. Are there farm animals down here? Maybe that's the source of the mess they were talking about, test subject animals or something. He continues past the glass boxes, searching for someone who can direct him toward the mess. As he walks, he feels dozens of eyes on him and stops to glance over his shoulder. His stomach drops as he sees that the creatures he thought were puppets have moved. They turn to face him as he passed by, eyes locked onto his back. Whatever these things are, they're alive and they're all watching him. He shudders but continues walking. At the other side of the hall, he can see a huge red spill on the tile floor. His footsteps quicken as he approaches the spill, and a metallic smell fills his nose. He had assumed it was some sort of leakage from machinery, but now, up close, he can tell it's blood. That's it. No paycheck is worth whatever is going on here. He turns to leave, abandoning the mop cart, and comes face to face with a giant furry thing at least eight feet tall. It grins down at him, reaching toward him with outstretched arms. Before he can run, it wraps those arms around him and pulls him into an inescapable, bone-crushing hug. He struggles, but he can't break free. He can't breathe. The air squeezed from his lungs. In a halting, inhuman voice, the monster says, Teamwork makes the dream work. Then, everything goes black. About one week after that janitor's ill-fated first day at work, the local police station received a video transmission from an unidentified man reporting an emergency at the facility. No further information was given, other than the exact location of the facility and the insistence that help be sent as quickly as possible. When the police arrived, however, they quickly realized that the situation was above their pay grade and contacted an organization much more experienced with handling unusual occurrences, the SCP Foundation. The Foundation quickly arrived, administered amnestics to all witnesses, and investigated the area. There they found something unlike anything they had ever seen before, and for the SCP Foundation, that was saying something. All human personnel at the facility had been terminated or were missing altogether. There was still activity present in the building, however, though none of it was human. There were anomalous creatures roaming the facility uninhibited. They did not resemble humans or any known animals, but instead looked more like costumed characters from a children's television show along the lines of Sesame Street or Barney. The site manager's office was completely empty of any files, and all hard drives found within had been wiped. Every surface had been sterilized and cleaned to remove any DNA evidence or fingerprints. The anomalous creatures were promptly captured, though they did not go without a fight. Several of the creatures were heard moving through the vents and were unable to be removed due to their speed, agility, and excretion of caustic material. In the underground laboratory spaces of the facility, the Foundation agents discovered glass tubes filled with amniotic fluid in which underdeveloped specimens were being grown. Agents also discovered containment chambers made of bulletproof glass, as well as pens filled with deceased farm animals, including cows, chickens, and goats. Once the Foundation had rounded up all of the creatures, the facility was blocked off from the outside world and given the official designation SCP-3325. SCP-3325 is an abandoned facility belonging to Real Characters Industries. The facility includes a recording studio, a series of underground laboratories, staff living quarters, storage, containment areas, and an industrial-grade incinerator. There are also several administrative areas, as well as a helipad on the structure's roof. 
The containment areas are home to a collection of biologically engineered organisms that bear a cursory resemblance to puppets or human beings wearing plush costumes, like those seen on children's television shows. For research purposes, these organisms have been designated SCP-3325-1. Despite their colorful appearance, which could even be mistaken for inviting and wholesome from a distance, instances of SCP-3325-1 are incredibly hostile to humans and any other organisms outside their own species. Though they are vulnerable to attacks with conventional weapons, these creatures lack any sense of pain and will continue to go after an intended target until they are effectively destroyed. In addition to their penchant for aggression, the instances of SCP-3325-1 are carnivorous and will eat any meat they are given access to. Thankfully, these organisms lack reproductive organs, so there won't be any baby plush monsters running around anytime soon. Instances of SCP-3325-1 behave in an unpredictable manner, though their most common activities are either staring at personnel blankly for long stretches of time, attempting to attack them, or repeating assorted canned children's television-friendly phrases in voices that Foundation personnel have described as unsettling and disturbing. Over the course of the initial discovery and containment of SCP-3325, SCP Foundation staff created an observation log describing all known types of SCP-3325-1. The breakdown is as follows. SCP-3325-1A Long neck avian organism with feathers, 3 meters tall. Its wings are redundant, unable to facilitate flight. Instances are able to reach a speed of approximately 72 kilometers an hour. Aggressive behavior patterns are similar to that of a cassowary. Instance frequently damages its beak by running into objects. Color varies. I've encountered cassowaries before while conducting field research and let me just say, the dinosaurs never really did die out. They live on in those monstrous birds. But I digress. SCP-3325-1B Bipedal reptilian organism, observed in colors of purple, green, and yellow. SCP-3325-1C Bipedal organism covered in fur, 1 meter tall, able to sprint at speeds of around 60 kilometers an hour, observed to attack in packs. Upon acquiring a target, an instance will vocalize a random phrase, which elicits aggressive behavior in other nearby instances. Color varies. SCP-3325-1D Unknown organism that hides in vents. Object is able to secrete and project a corrosive fluid. The appearance of the organism is unknown. Specimens have yet to be obtained. SCP-3325-1E Bipedal reptilian organism, 5 meters tall. Constantly sings in a distorted voice. The lyrics of its song are unintelligible, presumably due to malformed vocal cords. Only one instance has been encountered. The other observed variety of SCP-3325-1 is not one specific type of organism, but rather a collection of malformed creatures characterized by the presence of conditions that, in any other organism, would cause death shortly after, if not during birth. These include but are not limited to necrosis, missing skin, tumors, additional organs in places where they shouldn't be, or other life-threatening deformations. As you might imagine, the appearance of specimens with this classification varies greatly. Following my initial research into SCP-3325, several addenda were added to the official file, consisting of several pieces of pertinent and often troubling media. The first was a brochure discovered on the floor of the facility, depicting a dissatisfied crying child standing next to a puppet, in contrast to an image of the same child laughing and clapping in the presence of an SCP-3325-1 specimen. In addition to these images, the brochure contains this text. In today's world, children are bored of animation, puppets, costumes, and even the once groundbreaking computer-generated graphics. They've seen it all. They know it's all fake. Children nowadays want more. But what is the next step in the entertainment industry? Think outside the box. We're not talking about puppets or any of those materials children know are fake. We, as humans, inherently need to associate with living, breathing creatures, not puppets or moving pictures. We're talking about real characters. Our goal is to provide children with characters that are alive, that will teach them how to manage their emotions and solve life problems realistically. You can't get more real than that.
During a subsequent sweep of the facility grounds, an SCP Foundation employee discovered a videotape wedged between the wall and a large paper mache apple. Scrawled in pen across the tape's case were the words, We shouldn't have played God. A transcript of the videotape's contents is included in the file's second addendum, which I will attempt to summarize for you now. The video depicts an unidentified woman standing next to a green instance of the cassowary-like avian species of SCP-3325-1. Two men stand behind the camera, directing the action. Context clues suggest that this tape was intended to serve as a demonstration of the facility's characters, possibly for potential clients or investors. At the start of the video, the woman expresses discomfort with the bird-like creature, which stares at her, still and unblinking. She is instructed to say her lines as scripted, but when action is called and the actress begins to speak, the creature bites her arm. One of the men steps in front of the camera to intervene, but the entity does not respond to his commands. Even when the man begins to strike the creature with a baton, it does not budge. Instead, it bites down harder and harder until blood is drawn. Security is called and the footage is cut short. After the first tape was discovered, the Foundation conducted several more sweeps of the property in an attempt to locate any additional media they may have missed the first time. During a search of the security room, an officer's backpack was located. It contained several personal items including a very expired yogurt, a Nicholas Sparks novel, and a bag of sour cream and onion chips. At the bottom of the bag, however, another tape was found. This one appeared to have been surveillance footage captured by security cameras. This was particularly notable given that all other surveillance footage found at the facility had been destroyed or corrupted, most likely deliberately. To this date, this is the only security footage successfully recovered from SCP-3325. The footage depicts two figures, presumably security guards, standing on a catwalk, looking down at containment pens filled with instances of SCP-3325-1. Each guard holds a long pole with a device attached to the tip, appearing to function similarly to a taser or a cattle prod. The guards talk amongst themselves, joking about shocking the creatures for fun. One guard points out a particular instance of SCP-3325-1, which is standing still and staring dead ahead. The other guard points out another stagnant creature, which appears to be staring directly at the other guard. Disquieted by this, the guard decides to knock the entity's hat off of its head. He grabs an empty bottle, throwing it at the instance. The bottle collides with the hat, but the item does not budge. Instead, it breaks open and begins to bleed, revealing it to be a part of the creature's body rather than a costume piece. The two guards begin to panic at the sight of the security camera before asking Danny in the security room to take the tape. The second guard admonishes the first for his behavior and the footage cuts. The next addendum to the SCP-3325 file is, in the opinion of this researcher, the most disturbing. Field agents retrieved 79 steel containers from a storage area on the bottom floor of the facility. 41 of these containers contained human bodies preserved in a formaldehyde solution. Additionally, each container had documents attached, detailing each person's name and position at the company, as well as the cause of their death. Causes of death listed included mauling, organ failure, necrosis, and scheduled termination. SCP-3325 is classified as Euclid. Currently, SCP-3325 is contained on site, surrounded by a fence and guarded by no fewer than four security guards at any given time. Due to the isolated nature of the location, no further security measures have been deemed necessary. As for the specimens of SCP-3325-1, they are kept in large animal containment cells at a research sector whose precise designation has been redacted from official files. Each of these containment cells has an audio recording device inside. Each specimen is to be fed twice a day on a diet of raw meat, and no direct interaction between research staff and these specimens is permitted without first tranquilizing the entity. The effort to locate and contain all pieces of equipment associated with SCP-3325, as well as any documents pertaining to it, is an ongoing project. At this time, it's uncertain if any of us will ever know what Real Characters Industries was up to, and when it turned from an attempt to revolutionize the children's entertainment market to something far more sinister. What did the researchers discover that signed their eventual death warrants? Was the project truly abandoned, or just moved deeper underground to a new facility staffed with fresh faces who won't ask too many questions? One thing is certain. Be wary of cuddly new characters that appear at theme parks, at birthday parties, and on screen in the coming years. 
It's possible that these creatures are just actors in suits or life-size puppets, and all they want is a hug. But it's also possible that their wide, vacant eyes and friendly smiles hide an uncontrollable rage, an unpredictable intelligence, and a thirst for blood. A young woman steps onto her bathroom scale. She holds her breath and squeezes her eyes shut, afraid to see the results as she listens to the dial spinning. When it slows to a stop, she opens her eyes and looks down. She balks at the result. 150 pounds? That's unacceptable in her eyes. She steps off the scale and examines her reflection in the full-length mirror. In truth, her weight is far from out of control, but when she looks at herself, she can't help but see flaws. The subtle ring of pudge around her middle, the way her butt sticks out just a little too far for her liking, the very faint thickness around her cheeks and chin that hint at her history of snacking. As she leaves the bathroom, she reflects on her situation. Of course she's gaining weight. How could it be any other way? For the last two years, she's been in lockdown during a pandemic, and she's barely left her apartment. She let her gym membership lapse, and instead of cycling to work, she's instead taking the easy way out by just driving. And it's not like she gets much exercise in her free time either. During these last two years of isolation, she's mostly stayed in and watched television. She's discovered a particular love for trashy daytime talk shows and court dramas. Intellectually, she knows that they're the equivalent of junk food, but at the same time, there is a certain mindless charm to them. She would be embarrassed to admit it to any of her friends, but she does enjoy just turning off her brain and absorbing some silly talk show about professional stunt dwarves or Satan-worshipping furry juggalos. That sort of entertainment has been a boon to get her through the tough times. Nevertheless, it's time to make a change. She promises herself that she's going to get into shape. Today, instead of vegging out on the couch, she's going to make an effort. She's going to go out and get some exercise and, she tells herself, she's going to watch those extra pounds melt away right before her eyes. She hopes that her old gym clothes will still fit her. After all, she's definitely put on some extra weight since her last trip to the gym. After rummaging through her drawers, she finds what she's looking for her spandex gym shorts and sports bra. She quickly changes her clothes and is relieved to see that, although they might be a little snugger than she would like, they still fit her pretty well. That's a good sign. She probably won't even have to work very hard to get herself down to her ideal weight. It's all a matter of willpower, she tells herself. I was fit before, so that means I should be able to do it again. All I have to do is avoid temptation. I'll just have to make sure I stay active instead of watching trash TV all day. After all, I don't want to rot my brain too much. On the first day, she actually does an admirable job of sticking to her plan. She cycles to work, enjoying the fresh air and the reassuring post-workout burn in her legs that let her know that she's making progress. She throws away all the junk food in her refrigerator and goes shopping for healthy fruits and vegetables. And, most important of all, she limits her television time. She knows that trashy TV is probably her biggest addiction, even more than junk food, so she needs to be careful of that. On the second day, though, she notices something strange. She starts off with a simple, healthy breakfast, just some granola and a glass of juice. It's barely enough to satisfy her, but she knows that she has to make sacrifices if she expects to actually lose any weight. After breakfast, she decides to go out for a jog. As she's out on the street, she's overcome with sudden hunger. Of course, that's to be expected. She's on a diet now, so it's going to take some time to adjust to these smaller meals. She puts her hand to her rumbling stomach and grimaces. She's never felt this hungry before. If she didn't know better, she would think that she hadn't eaten for a week with the amount of pain that she's feeling. In fact, she's actually starting to feel a little woozy, and she has to lean against a light post to keep from fainting. She shakes her head to clear her thoughts. Okay, she thinks. I must have misjudged how many calories I need to get me through a morning. Her eyes stray to a nearby coffee shop. She sighs in relief. She thinks to herself, I'll just pop in there and get myself a small snack, just a little something to keep my blood sugar up. She walks into the cafe and gets in line. As she waits, she can't help but stare at the rows of pastries on display under the glass. They all look delicious, and she is really hungry. She fully intends to only get a bagel with a little smear of cream cheese, but when she gets to the counter, she finds herself ordering way too much food. I'd like two scones, three danishes, and a bear claw, she says. Also a large super raspberry frappuccino with extra syrup and whipped cream. The words just tumble out of her mouth, almost as if it's not her saying them, but rather some other voice speaking through her mouth. What the… I didn't say that, she stammers. The clerk behind the counter eyes her strangely, and the young woman feels too embarrassed to protest further. She steps aside and waits for her order, pondering the strange event that just happened. Is she possessed? She's not a superstitious person. 
but she can't think of any other explanation for what just happened. She can admit to herself that she has broken down and lost to temptation over a tasty snack in the past, but this? This is ridiculous. Eventually, when the clerk hands her the order, she rationalizes the whole thing away. I must just be having a hunger hallucination, she says to herself. Obviously, I need to be a little more careful about not being so strict about my diet. I'm sure if I just eat sensibly, I won't have an experience like that again. Her stomach grumbles again, reminding her of the original reason why she stepped into this coffee shop. She retreats to a table in the corner and tears open the bag. She wolfs down her pastries with gusto and slurps at her rich, creamy drink. When she's finished, she sighs in satisfaction, although the uncomfortable full feeling in her belly reminds her of her predicament. She only meant to eat enough to keep her from fainting, but instead, she's eating herself silly, and it's only day two of the diet. This does not bode well. Okay, she tells herself, this is my last cheat. From now on, I'm gonna be serious about this diet. She stands up and leaves the cafe, ready to complete the rest of her jog. But then, something even stranger happens. On the television, the matriarch of the family is furious. She has forbidden her daughter from marrying the gardener because she believes that he is too low class for her high-born daughter. But what she doesn't realize is that her daughter is in love and that she is determined to make it work. The daughter and the gardener have eloped and the matriarch is hiring a private detective to track them down. Meanwhile, the matriarch's long-lost twin brother, whom she thought died in a plane crash in the tropics, has actually been alive the entire time. He has been in a South American hospital recovering from amnesia, but now he returns to the family estate, ready to claim his share of the inheritance. These events are all noted by the family's shady lawyer, who has big plans to usurp the family fortune himself. Unbeknownst to the family, he is actually secretly working for their mortal enemies and business rivals to destroy them. The young woman laughs, shoving a handful of potato chips into her mouth. Oh man, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes now. That lawyer is playing them all like fiddles. Suddenly, she startles, as if she's just waking up. Where is she? Wasn't she just in that coffee shop? How is it that she's at home? And why is she eating potato chips? She was sure that she threw out all the junk food in the house. She must have bought a bag on her way back home from jogging, but she literally cannot remember it. And what is she doing now? Watching television and eating junk food? In disgust, she grabs the remote and shuts off the TV. She was supposed to be jogging, and instead, she's sitting at home and watching stupid soap operas. The thing that worries her the most is her apparent blackout. She remembers nothing about her trip home from the coffee shop, although the evidence of the potato chip bag indicates that she must have stopped at a convenience store or supermarket on the way home. How could she forget something like that? I really must be having a blood sugar issue, she tells herself reassuringly, even though deep down, she knows that can't be the case. She had the blackout after eating the pastries at the coffee shop, so that can't be the cause. But she really doesn't want to think about that, so she puts it out of her head with a renewed promise to commit to her exercise and fitness program. Over the next few days, she makes a valiant effort to keep her promise. She cycles when she can, she jogs when she remembers, and yet, the blackouts continue. And no matter where she is when she loses her memory, she always recovers in the same place, back home on her couch, always in the middle of eating some fatty junk food, always staring at the television set. Sure, she's always had an unhealthy television habit and she knows that trashy talk shows and silly soap operas are her biggest weakness, but it doesn't make any sense that she would be seeking them out when she's in some kind of fugue state, right? As the weeks roll by, the young woman finds that her weight keeps rising. When she steps onto the bathroom scale, she's shocked to see that the dial points to 200 pounds. She's doing everything right, she thinks. How is that possible? How is it possible that she's ballooned up an extra 50 pounds since deciding to slim down? She can't fit into her old gym clothes anymore. She can barely tug the spandex shorts up to her thighs, and even if she could, she's afraid that they're going to split apart. In desperation, she switches to an old stretchy sweatsuit. It's the only thing that she owns that still fits her. This is just a temporary setback, she tells herself as she stares at her bloated reflection in the bathroom mirror. I just have to work harder. And she does. Or does she? When she goes to ride her bike, she finds that it's no longer strong enough to support her weight. She can't perch on the seat comfortably and the steel body frame starts to creak when she rests her full weight upon it. She steals her resolve. Sure, it might be embarrassing to go out in public wearing an ill-fitting sweatsuit and riding a bike groaning under her bulk, but she really has no choice. This time, she's going to do it. And she probably did ride her bike to work, right? She's not sure. The next thing that she knows, she's back at home, spread across the couch, basking in the comforting glow of the television. The floor is covered in empty bags and cartons, and her face is slathered with crumbs and sauce. The last thing that she remembers is that she was just about to go for a bike ride, but now she's back at home, and it looks like she just completely ruined her diet. 
She lifts her arm with some effort and stares at her watch. She's lost almost a whole day. That's the longest blackout yet. She must have gone out cycling and made her way home where she decided to reward herself for her strenuous efforts with a little snack. That's the only logical explanation. She tries to reassure herself that maybe she's past the worst of it, but she finds that these mysterious blackouts keep happening. They happen while she's at work, while she's at the gym, while she's out cycling, but she always comes to in the same place, sitting on her sofa at home, in front of the TV, surrounded by the debris of a massive meal. Again, she wonders if maybe she's having some sort of reaction to her new low-calorie diet. Maybe she's been cutting back so far on her food intake that she's starting to have fainting spells. Maybe her diet food is tainted in some way. But that doesn't explain why she keeps gaining weight. The scale in her bathroom doesn't lie. It keeps reporting higher and higher numbers. And as much as she tries to reassure herself that it must just be broken, her ever-tightening clothes and ever-widening reflection tell her otherwise. Her trips to the gym become less and less frequent as she finds that other patrons have started to stare and whisper about her. Are they laughing at her for not being able to control her weight? Are they whispering about how her new flab is spilling from the confines of her sweatsuit? She can't even run on the treadmill for more than a few minutes without being completely winded, and she's too wide to balance on her bike now. The young woman has grown absolutely massive, to the point that she completely fills the whole couch. She chews her way through yet another bag of potato chips, her eyes never straying from the ever-chattering television set. She barely moves from this spot, her tremendous girth sinking into a permanent groove in the cushions as the couch springs groan. She barely notices, however, because she's much too intent on enjoying herself. She loves to eat, and every bite brings her untold joy, her taste buds tingling with delight. She is constantly full, so much so that she feels slightly sick, so bloated that she feels like she might just burst, but she's powerless to resist the siren call of junk food. She scarfs down entire boxes of cookies and cartons of ice cream without a thought, having turned into the very definition of a mindless eater. Only occasionally does she rouse herself from this stupor of gorging, to reach for her telephone, to order more takeout or more grocery delivery, always choosing the most calorie-laden options. Other than eating, her attention is completely devoted to her television set. She watches a constant stream of daytime talk shows, laughing along with the studio audience as the hosts parade out an assortment of society's biggest freaks. Sometimes she'll switch the channel to watch soap operas, becoming so wrapped up in the ridiculous plot twists and melodramatic acting that she completely forgets the passage of time. Her bicycle stands propped against the wall in the hallway, completely forgotten and untouched now for months. At this point, all thoughts of losing weight have utterly evaporated, and all that she cares about is satisfying her appetites for junk food and junk television. One day, she suddenly shakes her head and looks down at herself in horror, as if seeing herself for the first time. What the? She says in disbelief. She drops her half-eaten carton of ice cream and grabs at her fleshy middle with her hands, as if to make sure that it's all her and not some kind of crazy dream. Her hands sink deep into her new flesh, and she realizes to her shock that indeed she has eaten herself into morbid obesity. How is this possible? I can't be this big. I was only… only… Her words trail off, as a sound of an organ sting from the soap opera on TV diverts her attention. Within seconds, her eyes have glazed over and her hands move to pick up the dropped carton of ice cream. Her worries about her growing size forgotten, she's now only concerned with watching until the next commercial break. It might seem unbelievable that someone could undergo such a startling physical and mental transformation, but what that young woman experienced has led to her being classified by the Foundation as SCP-2611. SCP-2611 is, as you might have expected, a young woman currently weighing approximately 500 pounds. Her mobility is limited due to her weight, although SCP staff encourage her to take light exercise whenever possible in hopes of preventing her mobility from deteriorating further. She also suffers from several health issues related to her weight and lifestyle, including diabetes, for which she is receiving treatment by Foundation personnel. Her awareness of her situation and surroundings is severely limited, as she spends most of her time in a stupor, but when she is lucid, she believes that she is in a special facility receiving treatment for her weight problem. In reality, SCP-2611 is under observation because of SCP-2611-1. SCP-2611-1 is a mass of sentient fat located on SCP-2611's left side. SCP-2611-1 has become integrated with several of SCP-2611's vital organs, making it too dangerous to attempt to remove SCP-2611-1 via liposuction or other means. SCP-2611-1 has gradually exerted increasing control over the mind and actions of its host, to the point that SCP-2611 is only fully conscious for one to two hours daily. 
The rest of the time, SCP-2611-1 is fully in control of its host's behavior. Prior to coming to the SCP facility, SCP-2611-1 influenced its host to consume massive amounts of calories, leading to the mysterious and sudden weight gain that we observed earlier. This was possibly an attempt by SCP-2611-1 to increase its own size and influence, but as of yet, its reasons, as well as how it exerts control over its host, are unknown. When in control, SCP-2611-1 can speak through its host, communicating in standard American English. SCP-2611's access to food has been limited since her arrival at the Foundation, so as to prevent her weight gain from accelerating to dangerous levels. Other than eating, SCP-2611-1's main interest appears to be daytime television. Attempts to communicate with SCP-2611-1 have so far met with little success due to the anomaly's limited attention span for anything other than the minutiae of daytime television. In a conversation with one researcher, however, SCP-2611-1 let slip that it preferred daytime television to the programming watched by, quote, that other guy, suggesting that it lived inside a different host before it eventually took up residence within the body of SCP-2611. At another point, while in the middle of a conversation about a court drama, SCP-2611-1 suddenly announced, Kill it! Kill it now! I don't care if I die! Staff believe that this might not have been SCP-2611-1 at all, but rather the voice of SCP-2611 trying to break through the hypnotic control of her parasite to call for help. At this time, no drastic action is recommended until further observations can be made. SCP-2611-1 does not appear to be contagious, and the way that it bonds with the host is unknown, so it is currently classified as safe. At the moment, SCP-2611-1 is the only known instance of its kind. However, considering rising levels of obesity worldwide, it is not unfathomable to think that there could be countless other instances influencing the behavior of other hosts to dedicate their lives to consuming food and television. Who knows? It's not like most of us would need that much convincing. Seeing that shadowy figure coming towards him makes the worker turn and run. He hasn't had the time nor the luxury of freezing on the spot or waiting for it to get closer so he could get a clearer view. He just runs. With every pace, every hurried, horrified step, comes the mental image of the strange figure gaining on him. In his head, every movement he catches in the corner of his eye, every shuffling sound he detects, the thing was right behind him, inches away and ready to strike. So he just keeps on running. Only seconds ago, it was just standing under a streetlight, a ways ahead of the worker, barely moving. He calls out to it, assuming it's a person, somebody may be lost or in need of help. But then, it steps into the light, and it's not a person at all. The head of the suit isn't on properly, it droops at an angle like it hasn't been affixed or is barely hanging on. The crude, lazy-eyed face is haphazardly drooping. That too isn't on right, as the entire head sways unnervingly with each approaching step. Maybe underneath the suit, hiding beneath all that dirty orange fur, still coated in grime despite the rain. Perhaps there's a person in there, whose arm hefts an old baseball bat as they plod closer and closer to the worker. But all he sees is the monster. The filthy costume might be clumsily made, but the worker instantly recognizes the all-too-familiar resemblance of an orange cat from a popular comic strip. It's what starts him running. That and the blunt weapon the monster is holding as it menacingly makes its way closer. The downpour doesn't let up as the worker turns a corner, met with the sights of two bright, blinding white beams of light cutting through the rain. A car, speeding its way down the road. It catches the worker in its headlights, and he starts frantically waving his arms, encased in the sodden fabric of his jacket. Help! Oh, please! Please help me! He yells. Something's coming after me! I think it's trying to kill me! The driver doesn't stop, instead simply cruising past. The worker can just about see through the passenger side window, the vehicle's sole occupant giving him a strange look from inside the safety of his car. Almost as quickly as it appears, the car has driven off, its headlights already fading from view thanks to the rain. What the worker doesn't realize is that the driver's look of confusion wasn't directed at him, but at the thing following him. The creature gives a low, animalistic sound, which causes the worker to spin around. Now he sees it, right up close in all its foul, ginger glory. A tail dangles lazily from the lower portion of the suit, trailing in puddles laden with muck, the water making the fur even dirtier than it already is. It's so close that the awful, pungent stench of the thing hits the worker's nostrils, a sickening smell that somehow seems to fit with the grim, gross costume and its wearer. 
Seeing the wet, fur-coated suit so close, he realizes that it isn't covered in the soft, plush, synthetic coat that he expects a costume like that to be made of. It looks real, like actual cat hair, on a huge humanoid shape with the legs and arms of a man. Arms that were midway through swinging a baseball bat right at the worker's head. He ducks just in time, the dull wooden bat glancing off the bricks of a nearby building, narrowly missing the worker's head. As it bounces off the wall, the blunt weapon slips from the soggy gloves of the suit and clatters to the ground. The second he hears the wooden bat land on the ground, the worker turns his heel and runs again, taking advantage of those precious few seconds to get further distance between him and his attacker. It's only exactly as he turns his back that he wishes he'd reached for the bat himself to fight back. Rushing further down the rain-swept street, the worker can hear the heavy slumping footsteps of the suited attacker giving chase. He alternates between looking straight ahead, the raindrops streaming down his face and getting into his eyes, and daring to glance back over his shoulder. Every time he does, he's met again with the horrifying sight of the suit behind him. He wants nothing more than to escape, to get out of this nightmare wherein he is soaked head to toe in rainwater and fear, running for his life, from someone dressed as the comic strip cat he sees every day. But as strong as his will to escape is, he can't bear to let the fur-suited pursuer out of his sight for even a second. If he can't see it, then it might be anywhere. At least looking told him that he was still right behind him, bearing down on the worker with its bat now firmly back in hand. The shrill noise of chain links rattling sounds behind him, as the attacker in the suit starts striking a nearby fence, making the worker more and more aware that, with every strike, it's getting closer. Through the relentless downpour, the worker spots a shape standing on the sidewalk just a few feet ahead. Short, stationary, something he sees every day of his life but never pays any notice to. But tonight, it might just be the thing that saves his life. A trash can. It's full, and that means heavy, and any second now, he'll be close enough to reach it. A plan forms in seconds, erupting like a fire with gasoline thrown on it. If that gasoline was pure, terrified adrenaline of being chased by someone in an orange cat costume, Reaching out, as soon as his fingertips grip the wet metal rim of the can, the worker pulls as hard as possible, his instincts keeping him from stopping running. The trash can clatters behind him as he passes, followed by the heavy thud of the attacker falling to the ground as it trips over the obstacle and lands furry head first in the garbage now strewn over the sidewalk. The worker knows he's only got another short window, another blessing of a precious few seconds to get far enough away from his attacker. He turns, changing course to rush across the street. There's an old warehouse over there. If there are security guards working, they might be able to help. If not, and the place is unguarded, then at least it could be somewhere to hide. A sudden blaring noise pierces the worker's eardrums before he can make it all the way to the opposite sidewalk. It's a horn, coupled with a bright pair of lights appearing as if from nowhere. Then, before he can turn to see it coming, impact. First against the hood of the car, speeding through the rain towards him, unable to stop in enough time. Next, the pain of hitting the jagged blacktop of the road. The second impact, as the worker lands a few feet away, spots of rain still pattering against his face as everything goes from dark to pitch black for a few seconds. His head floods with scenes from earlier that day, as if his life was about to start flashing before his eyes, only in reverse. The news of the comic strip doing poorly arrives at the Paws Inc. office, and with it, the knowledge that, if there are going to be layoffs, then he'll be first. He's the new hire, after all. It didn't matter that the once-beloved comic of a cartoon cat is losing its popularity, going stale after so many years in print. It upset the investors, and the worker has been worrying all day if he'd be the one fired to appease them, until he suddenly remembers what's coming after him. Fighting back and clawing his way back to consciousness, he struggles back to his feet, screaming with pain. He's injured, that much he can certainly tell, even if he doesn't know how badly. Hey! Hey, mister! The driver calls, stopping his car and starting to climb out of the vehicle. It's a different driver and car this time, and unlike the first, he makes the effort to stop, a mistake that is about to cost him greatly. He sees the worker getting back up, ignoring his calls. He raises his voice to cut through the noise of the pouring rain. Hey, you okay? I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. My lights were on low, wipers are going, it wasn't until you rushed out across the street that… Anyway, look, let me at least get you to a hospital. We can exchange our insurance information once they get you all patched up. The worker wasn't listening. He hears the driver's words but pays him no mind. He's still so intent on getting away that it takes him a second to realize. The car. It's a way out. And then, the worker makes the same mistake as the driver. He stops. And when he does, he sees what has clambered back to its fur-coated feet and is now shuffling towards the driver. Look out! The worker yells. The driver turns, just in time to see. What the hell? He exclaims. Wait a minute, why are you dressed in a Garfield costume? Whack! 
The sound of the bat being swung at the driver makes the worker feel sick. He turns his back and moves as quickly as he can towards the warehouse, despite the pain and the horrified screams coming from behind. Beneath the rain, there's something else, a twisted, vile squelching noise that quickly snuffs out the driver's dying cries. The worker doesn't dare to look back this time. He doesn't want to see what's happening. Lifting a heavy metal shutter and pulling it shut behind him, he finds himself in the warehouse. It's completely deserted. There isn't a single sign of life anywhere. The only sound is the pattering of rainwater against the hard concrete floor, dripping through a hole in the ceiling. Guided by the low, glowing light of the street lamps outside that bleeds through the warehouse windows, the worker starts fumbling around for a place to hide. Just as he crawls underneath a large pallet rack, he hears a metallic rattling as the fur-suited monstrosity lifts up the shutter. It's inside. With heavy, plodding steps in its suit, it paces up and down the aisles of discarded shelving. The worker clamps his soaked hands against his mouth, trying to mask his panicked breathing, only to let out a scream as he feels something grab his ankle and pull. With ease, the thing dressed as a disheveled Garfield pulls him out of his hiding place. Instinctively, the worker thrashes his legs, landing a solid kick to the creature. As his foot connects, he notices it doesn't feel like a person underneath the suit. There's no body, no familiar outline of a human being beneath all the soggy fur and stench. It's just a slimy mass. Nonetheless, the kick knocks the garish Garfield back, only a few paces, but better than nothing. He scrabbles to his feet, standing and running as fast as he can in the opposite direction, only to hit a wall at the far side of the warehouse. The shutter is the only way out, and right now it's wide open. But Garfield stands between the worker and freedom. He turns to dart down the next aisle, between the rows of shelves, keeping his eyes on the attacker as he passes underneath the hole in the ceiling. The rain is still coming down through it, leaving a puddle on the floor. The worker's focus is locked on the beast. He suddenly feels his foot slipping out from under him, that awful lurch of his heart as he falls. The puddle, he slipped on it and come crashing down to the ground. The force of the concrete striking his back knocks all the breath from his lungs. Everything is spinning in a nauseating mix of pain, disorientation, and terror. Above, through the unrepaired ceiling, drops of rain come pouring down on him. Then, a low, agonized meow from somewhere nearby. The monster, Garfield, brings its bat swinging down and sharply connecting with the worker lying on the ground. A new surge of pain racks his body, right at the hip where the baseball bat just landed in an unforgiving blow. The worker can do nothing but scream in pain and fear. A horrible sound, like something wet tearing, fills his ears over his own cries. He remembers the sickening feeling of a slimy mass being aggressively pushed into his face. It's disgusting, rancid, but even under all the horror and the repulsive taste, he can detect familiar hints. Pasta, beef, tomato sauce, cheese, all of it moldy and rotten, but still recognizable. The monstrous SCP-3166 forces further fistfuls of lasagna down the worker's throat until the screaming stops. He'd always hated Mondays. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-674, The Exposition Gun Makes Nintendo Real Life.